Everyone had a happy Thanksgiving, and remember that the thanks are in the giving, which is why we are all here today, to make sure that we can continue to do that in a way that is consistent with who we are here today. So I'm Council Member Idenik Miller. I'm the Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, and I'd like to um, thank you all for being here. And we, I'd like to say that my co-chair of the Small Business uh, um, uh, Council Member Robert Carnegie had an emergency and will not be here uh, this afternoon, this morning, and so um, I'm going to keep him in, in mind and prayer. Also, uh, so we will, for the fourth time, we'll be holding this hearing jointly uh, in attendance here today. Today we'll be discussing the Career Pathway Program, revisiting a number of uh, issues we discussed when the Council last held a hearing on this topic in January of 2016, and receiving an update from the Administration on its efforts is it is taken to fulfill the goals that we set out uh, more than three years ago. The Committee on Civil Service and Labor has particular interest in, in, in learning more about potential opportunities for partnerships in emerging industries such as hospitality, tourism, which is particular needs in Southeast Queens District, which I represent, and the status of the city's funded apprenticeships, particularly involving building trades, unions, quality control measures to ensure satisfaction of services with workforce development programs and the level of funding for career technical education programs as well. I'd like to acknowledge the members of the Civil Service and Labor Committee, Council Member Drum, and also the members of the uh, Small Business Committee, uh, Council Member Kozowitz and Council Member Perkins. Also, I'd like to uh, thank the staff for its work. Obviously, Council uh, Committee Council Matt Carlin, Kevin Karatsowitz, and Kendall Stevenson, Paul Stern, uh, for the work that they've done. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from the admin uh, and their latest report. So, without further ado. I'd like to call uh, Jackie Mallon and Barbara Chang. Ooh. Morning. Before we get started, I just need you to affirm uh, that, affirm. yes, that you affirm that you will speak the truth this morning on behalf of the people. You want to affirm first? I'm, I'm confirming my name. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I'm sorry? You're affirming that you're going Affirm to... Affirm that you will tell the truth. Oh, yes, I affirm that I will tell the truth. I, I do as well. Affirm I will tell sorry the truth. Sorry about that. It's Monday morning. It's having a hard time hearing. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Chair Miller, for the opportunity to speak about the Office of Workforce Development and our systems coordinating work. My name is Barbara Chang and I serve as the Executive Director of the Office of Workforce Development, Mayor's Office of Workforce Development. The WorkDev Office works primarily on policy, system coordination, and strategy, and we work in partnership with more than a dozen city agencies, as well as business leaders, education, and training providers, and community stakeholders to ensure the city's economic vitality today and in the future. We also oversee the Workforce Development Board, a body with a majority of business members required under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014. And we coordinate with the Center for Youth Employment, an initiative of the Mayor's Fund. In 2014, our office released the report, Career Pathways, One City Working Together, a guiding strategy describing how elements of the city's workforce system should align and connect to one, to one another to support the city's growing businesses and economic development and to ensure that New Yorkers are prepared to enter career track jobs in key sectors. The Career Pathways approach connects progressive levels of education, training, support services, and credentials while working with employers to grow a pipeline of skilled workers for in-demand occupations. In January of last year, our office testified regarding the Career Pathways progress update on the progress the city has made toward an efficient and effective workforce system that helps New Yorkers connect with careers that provide economic stability and mobility. 
Since the last time we, ap we appeared before you, we've made some progress in several of the key areas in the report. The first is building skills employers seek. Working with our partners at New York City Small Business Services, we supported the launch and growth of five industry partnerships announced in Career Pathways. These include the New York Alliance for Careers in Healthcare, the New York City Tech Talent Pipeline, the NYC Food and Beverage Hospitality Council, and the Construction and Manufacturing Partnerships. The goal of these partnerships is to work with industry to provide sustainable solutions to connect New Yorkers to opportunities in these sectors. And today, I'm joined to my right by uh, Jackie Mallon, the first Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services, who will speak further on the work of SBS in promoting these industry partnerships. The second is increasing participation in bridge and training. As we've shifted to career pathways as the framework for New York City's workforce development system, we've seen increased investments in training for growing sectors of the economy. When career pathways launched, we set a goal of providing occupational training to 30,000 New Yorkers a year by 2020. In fiscal year 17, we provided training to almost 24,000 New Yorkers, a 64% increase from the previous year. So we're pretty much on track for reaching that goal. In addition to increases in training, we've made significant strides in promoting bridge programming across the system. Bridge programs combine industry-specific instruction with foundational skills such as reading, math, and English. These programs allow job seekers with limited educational attainment and low English proficiency to make progress toward occupational goals as they build their basic skills. Bridge programs offer participants a clear step to education, occupational training, or employment. Following the Career Pathways approach, our goal is to invest in bridge programs that support individuals with low educational attainment and limited English skills on a path to a quality job. To determine the best approach for both job seekers and businesses, we've piloted new programs such as Bridge for, new, for Young Adults with Limited Educational Attainment, Bridge for English Language Learners, Bridge for Foreign-Born Workers with Advanced Degrees, and Sector Contextualization in Healthcare, Technology, and the Trades. We also launched the New York City Bridge Bank to share curricula that can be used by community-based organizations and other partners that want to offer bridge programs. Bridge programs are now included in a variety of city-funded programs, including HRA's career, uh, Youth Pathways, DYCD's in-school youth and out-of-school youth programs, the Young Adul Adult Literacy Pilot, and several training programs developed by the industry partnerships and launched by our partners at SBS. We look forward to continuing to invest in occupational training and bridge programs across the city's workforce system. The third is to improve job quality. The de Blasio administration continues to lead the way in providing better protections for workers, including paid sick leave and the Fair Scheduling Act. In 2015, we also launched Best for NYC, a campaign that recognizes employers who are committed to offering high-quality jobs and who value employee retention. Best for NYC has expanded to serve a network of 1,500 employers beyond the 2015 goal of 500 employers. Building on the success for Best for NYC, in 2017, more than 100 employers began work to adopt a workforce innovation to improve the quality of jobs for their employees, including hiring, training, and promotion. Earlier this month, J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation announced a grant that will deepen the impact of Best for NYC in the Bronx by connecting businesses to one-on-one -on -one support and business opportunities. The fourth, the fourth is connecting economic development in the workforce. Working with our partners across the city, our office works to connect economic development activities and growth sectors to low-income job seekers. In 2015, we launched Hire NYC, one of the largest targeted hiring programs in the nation which leverages our city purchasing power to create opportunities for more New Yorkers. Since the program launched, Hire NYC connected, has connected over 5,000 New Yorkers to job opportunities benefiting both businesses and job seekers. We've also supported efforts to connect New Yorkers to living wage work through the launch of Apprentice NYC and the New York Works Initiative, both of which are coordinated through EDC. The fifth is expand resources for youth employment. 
A project of the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, the Center for Youth Employment, is working to increase work experiences for young people to put them on career pathways. This past fiscal year, more than 92,000 young adults participated in summer jobs, internships, and mentorship experiences. This puts the Center for Youth Employment on pace to achieve the Mayor's goal of supporting at least 100,000 youth in career development experiences. We applaud the work of our co colleagues at CYE and the City Council to connect more young people to these opportunities, and we look forward to working with them both in the, in the coming years. The Center for Youth Employment also informed the final report of the Youth Employment Task Force that was released earlier this spring. The task force was co-led by Deputy Mayor Richard Bury and Council Finance Committee Chair Julissa Ferreras Copeland, and included leaders from nonprofits, industry, philanthropy, and government. The report issued several recommendations on the Summer Youth Employment Program, which has nearly doubled under this administration. From 36,000 in 2013, the year before the mayor took office, to nearly 70,000 this past summer. Additionally, funds have been baselined to ensure that the SYEP program remains at the highest level going forward. We're grateful for this productive partnership with the council. And six is coordinating systems change. To address workforce and industry needs at the appropriate scale and in a long-term sustainable way, we've been working to shift the workforce development system. The goal of the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development is to foster a more coordinated and collaborative effort across city-funded programs to connect New Yorkers to career pathways. This shift away from rapid attachment to work is evident in the types of programs this administration has invested in, such as courses that lead New Yorkers to qualify with family support, to, to careers with family supporting wages. The Office of Workforce Development led the effort to establish common definitions and metrics across city, all city programs. By establishing these measurements, we're shifting toward a system that is better coordinated and defines success beyond just training or job placement, but also the movement of an individual on a career path. To give a few examples of our work with agency partners, in 2015, the Human Resources Administration rele released a series of RF RFPs that demonstrated a shift away from rapid attachment of, to work and an investment in training and bridge programming for low-income job seekers. Likewise, with the support of the Council, DYCD included career pathways investments in both out-of-school and in-school youth programming. Our colleagues at SBS also continue to work with industry, neighborhoods, and small businesses to better connect the job seekers in need of this career, this city, to pathways to opportunity. Fundamentally, these, shift, these systems shifting changes lay the groundwork to realizing the career pathways goals of providing access to secure jobs for low-income, low-skilled New Yorkers and to help them maintain stable employment and earn a family supporting wage, while ensuring that New York City businesses can find the talent they need. To share more about this administration, what this administration has accomplished with industry partnerships, small businesses, and local talent, I'm now gonna turn on the mic over to Jackie Mellon of the New York City Office of Small Business Services. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Miller and the members of the Committee on Small Business and Civil Service and Labor. My name is Jackie Mallon, and I am the first Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting New Yorkers to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering vibrant neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today, I, I am pleased to provide Council with an update on our work in support of Mayor de Blasio's workforce development strategy career pathways, one city working together. In addition to assisting small businesses and commercial corridors, SBS is responsible for helping New Yorkers find jobs by connecting job seekers to employers and local residents to industry-informed training. Through our network of 21 Workforce One career centers, SBS provides recruitment expertise, industry knowledge, and skill-building workshops to match candidates to jobs. Annually, we successfully connect more than 25,000 New Yorkers with quality employment and nearly 4,000 New Yorkers with the training needed to advance their careers. In support of the objective to help workers secure good-paying jobs in fast-growing sectors laid out by Career Pathways, 
SBS has instituted a job quality policy, which requires businesses receiving free recruitment services through our Workforce One Career Centers to hire employees for full-time positions or pay at least the living wage rate, which is currently $13.65 per hour. As a result, to date we have seen a significant increase in the percent of New Yorkers connected to full-time work, from about 45% in 2014 to up around 80% uh, now in 2017. We've also seen a significant increase in the average wage of that work from $10.70 an hour in 2014 to uh, $13.25 in 2017. The city also utilizes our Workforce One Career Centers uh, to connect New Yorkers to open positions created through the city's purchases and investments via Hire NYC. Through the SBS-operated Hire NYC portal, vendors who receive certain new city contract awards are now required to consider New Yorkers for employment opportunities. As projected in Career Pathways, SBS has significantly increased our investment in helping New Yorkers prepare, connect, and advance in the key sectors, key sectors rather, that drive New York City's economy. Our training investments share two characteristics. One, the trainings are designed to help low-income New, York, New Yorkers gain access to living wage jobs that they otherwise struggle to find and secure. And two, the investments are informed by industry and designed to meet employer needs. One of the primary ways we ensure alignment with industry is through our industry partnerships. As proposed in Career Pathways, we have expanded our industry partnerships in tech and healthcare and have launched partnerships in food service, hospitality, construction, and industrial manufacturing. The goal of these industry partnerships is not only to connect New Yorkers to employment, but also to build a long-term sustainable connection between employers and the organizations that teach individuals the skills that are needed to enter and advance in the New York City job market. Through industry engagement, we are able to identify gaps in the labor market and develop new training models that can be replicated by providers throughout the city. We are aiming to address the systemic issues which have prevented some New Yorkers from participating in the economy of tomorrow. With input from the employers of the industry partnerships, SBS has launched a number of new occupational training models to better meet the needs of employers and job seekers, including models tailored for out-of-school, out-of-work young adults, immigrants, and other low-income New Yorkers. Healthcare has the largest private sector employment in New York City. With the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and recent New York State Medicare and Medicaid redesign, the sector has added a significant number of new occupations. Through the New York Alliance for Careers in Healthcare, which we call NIACH, um, our healthcare industry partnership, we have engaged healthcare employers to address the industry's rapidly changing labor force needs. To date, NIACH has developed a number of new training models, including a model designed to train low-income immigrants with limited English proficiency for jobs as bilingual medical assistants. NIACH has also worked with the New York City Department of Education to redesign the core healthcare curriculum used by career and technical education schools to reflect the needs of today's healthcare employers. Launched in 2014, our tech industry partnership, the Tech Talent Pipeline, which we often refer to as TTP, is designed to support the inclusive growth of the New York City tech sector, sector and prepare New Yorkers for 21st century jobs. The Tech Talent Pipeline works with 225 companies, 16 local colleges, and additional public and private partners to define employer needs, develop training, education, and recruitment models to meet those needs, and scale solutions throughout the city, delivering quality talent for the city's businesses and quality jobs for New Yorkers. Since the launch, TTP has developed 10 new trainings informed by industry, resulting in more than 450 people connected to employment. These efforts are just a part of the TTP's larger mission of catalyzing continuous and lasting alignment with industry throughout the city's public systems. For instance, TTP has worked closely with the City University of New York to launch an initiative to double the number of graduates with tech bachelor's degrees by 2022. Another growing industry that provides an opportunity for good paying jobs is construction. Our construction industry partnership the Mayor's Committee on Construction consists of the city's building construction trade unions, pre-apprenticeship programs, trade employers and associations, um, mayoral agencies, and, and other city public authorities. This year, the committee is focused on connecting more New Yorkers to apprenticeship programs through the Mayor's Green Job Corps program. Working with the Mayor's Office of, of Sustainability and Climate Policy, SBS is leading this three-year initiative, which will train roughly 3,000 individuals, individuals through a variety of trainings, including pre-apprenticeships. Last year, we launched our newest industry partnership, the New York City Food and Beverage Hospitality Council, an alliance of more than 30 leaders in food service to promote the sustained growth of the local food and beverage industry. The council's goals include addressing the industry's skills gap and labor shortages and helping small businesses navigate the regulatory environment. The council has informed new initiatives, including Stage NYC, a new training program which provides out-of-school, out-of-work youth 
on the job training and leads to careers in the restaurant industry, and Food Business Pathways, an entrepreneurship initiative designed to empower NYCHA residents to start and grow food businesses. We have also launched our industrial manufacturing industry partnership. Through this partnership, we are bringing together a wide range of manufacturing and industrial businesses across the city to address the industry's rapidly changing labor force needs and the fast pace of innovation. In support of the mayor and the city council's industrial action plan, we have launched a number of trainings to prepare New Yorkers for the industrial and manufacturing jobs of the future, including a contextualized high school equivalency diploma program in partnership with DOE's District 79 in West Farms up in the Bronx. Um, currently, this partnership is focused on launching the mayor's first apprenticeship NYC program for computer numerically controlled machinists. We expect that program to launch in the second quarter of next year. Through our industry partnerships, SBS is working hand in hand with the leaders of the fastest growing industries to ensure New Yorkers are equipped with the necessary skills to succeed in the 21st century economy. Thank you, and I'll, ha I'll be happy to answer um, any questions you have now. Okay. Thank you. Before we dive in with the questions, I'd like to acknowledge a council member. We've been joined by council members Valone, uh, Drum, and Eugene as well. So, thank you. So, uh, according to the Center for uh, Urban Future, the city has set an investment target uh, for these programs for $60 million per year. And thus far, has repurposed $6.4 million to uh, provide bridge programming opportunity for 1,000 New Yorkers with literacy level fourth to eighth grade. Currently, how much money has been allocated in terms of meeting the $60 million target? So I'll take that question. So uh, we have been able to, um, Right now, the number is closer to seven and a half million, so we've added about another million into the bridge programming uh, investment that we've made. Uh, the way that we're approaching this, and, and you should also know that HRA in their uh, recent RFP included bridge programming in their RFP uh, responses. And in, let me just try to, I think there are about 2,000 uh, New Yorkers that will be getting bridge programming through their career advancement program and another 1,500 through their youth pathways. So we're making strides in the investments in bridge programming. I think that the approach that we're taking is that a bridge programming, you know, the, the, the success of bridge programming has been shown and proven in cities like Seattle where it was really first introduced. And we love that model and it's the reason why I think a lot of agencies are starting to incorporate that in their RFPs and in their investments. Um, I think that what we're doing is we're beginning to pilot bridge programmings in the setting of New York City where we have a much more diverse population and we're looking to see what works in New York City as, as it relates to bridge programming. And so as those pilots come out with data, um, then I think we'll be, making, we'll be in, in a better position to make strategic investments at scale. Okay. Do we have a timetable on that? Uh, well, we're waiting for some of the data to come out. I mean, Jackie, you've got some in the industry partnerships. Where are we at with that? Um, yeah, I can tell you a little bit about some of the uh, bridge programs that we have uh, developed that are uh, tailored to meet the needs of both out of school, out of work youth so far. And uh, you can't hear me. Mm, Is that better? Yes. I'm usually such a loud mouth. That's. Yeah. Always surprising. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we have uh, uh, been working on a number of different uh, bridge training uh, program models. Um, those that are aim aiming at um, um, helping out-of-school, out-of-work youth um, get into the, the healthcare industry. Um, those without a high school equivalency diploma, we do that in partnership with the Department of Education. We do that um, actually three different tracks, um, uh, cable installation, um, medical assistance, and the third track is uh, uh, web development, sorry. In addition, we've, we've uh, developed uh, bridge programs to address the needs of, of um, foreign-born New Yorkers or immigrants. 
um, also in healthcare, there's a very strong demand for um, bimedical, um, bilingual medical assistance, and so we've developed a bridge program to help those with lower levels of English proficiency um, improve their English and, and get contextualized medical assistant terminology and get their certified uh, medical assistance license as well. Um, in addition, uh, commercial drivers, we have a, a, a bridge program that also helps um, those that are uh, recent immigrants and or have lower levels of English proficiency. Um, and we are working on a, a similar program in, in the food service industry. Um, if, so uh, how did you pay for, the, how did you fund these programs? Um, is it out of these same dollars? If what, and and what, are we seeing an increase in investment yeah, the, the, based the, on the, this? These programs are, are funded with uh, the Career Pathways um, dollars, in in part. It's probably blended with some other streams as well, but for sure, um, the, these are, are are Career Pathway funded in part. Mm hmm. Um. So let's talk about the workforce development portion of it and and you said there's 21 partners uh, and, and those they operate separately and independently of, of of your agency or any government agency correct the the 21 city agencies no not city agencies I'm sorry. the workforce developments are you, you may be referring to the career centers 21, I'm sorry 21 uh, workforce one career centers yes. oh, workforce one. Yeah. okay sorry are they, how do they operate, are they, are, are they government agencies or are they, are they contracted with government agencies? What are they specifically? So, so um, those are primarily uh, uh, federal WIOA funded um, Workforce One centers. There are 21 of them as there are throughout the five boroughs. Um, uh, some of them are, are uh, we are co-located with other agencies like the Department of Education and or, and or HRA. Um, uh, we are uh, all working together to to ensure that there's good coordination uh, among the, the various services at the agencies. But um, so there are 21. I wasn't that far off. Who runs them? Uh, well, we admit we are, we uh, run them, but they're contracted vendor partners that that operate them. If that's what you mean. That's exactly what I was. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what kind of oversight do we have on these? Workforce development centers that are operating here. Do we? So look, I'm going to, in, in the interest of, because I'm, I'm going to ask some questions on behalf of, of uh, my colleague uh, from small business, and I'm sure others have some questions. But in, in the interest, I will tell you that um, my office um, has had concerns. Um, from some of the centers citywide, and these have come from clients as well as some of uh, some of the employers, whether or not they were getting qualified folks, whether or not um, clients were being trained in the proper way, and whether or not they were most importantly being properly compensated as well. And so, we who oversees that to to ensure that our investment are creating real. Uh, Career opportunities. Um, so the I certainly would love to um, hear more about the specific uh, concerns, uh, uh, maybe offline, because I would want to address any issues that you have um, heard about. Um, but so there, the, the centers, the Workforce One Career Centers, are operated uh, through uh, contracts that SBS manages. But the the uh, further oversight is really provided by the Workforce Development Board. Um, which is uh, the, a board that is that is 51% uh, uh, private employers, and then a number of other um, and, uh, individuals that, that make up the board, and that's by uh, federal statute. We're required to for the board to have oversight over those funds. Yeah. Um, and, and the board is, is is at my office, meets quarterly, and we get reports from both SBS and DYCD, which are the two agencies that receive WIOA monies. So every quarter we have a dashboard and we're looking at the performance of the centers as well as the programs that are funded through the WIOA monies. So that's, that's the oversight from the Workforce Development Board. Uh, we've been joined by my esteemed colleague, uh, Elizabeth Crowley, and I'm sure she'll have some questions as well. Um, 
When we first, when we first had, when we had our first hearing uh, back in 2014, we talked about emerging, emerging industries. We talked about the development that was had construction and development that were taking place throughout the city. We're talking about hotels and hospitalities and what have we done to to take advantage of those opportunities. From an SPS perspective? Sure. Um, so from, a, from an SPS perspective, um, a couple of things I think we can, we can report back to you on. As I said, this year we launched, um, uh, well actually, yeah, uh, the New York City Food and uh, Hospitality um, Industry Partnership. And um, we have, uh, beginning with a, a, a program that is a, modeled after a, a, a French apprenticeship program for um, uh, prep cooks and line cooks, which there is a great shortage of here in New York City. Um, it's a three-month program that takes out-of-school, out-of-work youth, gives them some cl uh, classroom, initial classroom prep, and then puts them at a restaurant to, that is um, with a, a, a tailored um, on-the-job training program that, that models uh, an apprenticeship program. Um, in terms of, of, of development, maybe you're also getting at like higher NYC, um, which is a policy that was that was um, um, uh, developed by the mayor, where uh, city contracts over a certain amount, uh, the vendors are required to register on our portal, give us a, set, a, a list of all the open positions that, that are, they're going to need to hire for as a result of winning those contracts, and then um, work with us to, to review our candidates and, and uh, hire anybody that's a, that's a good fit. Is that, is that what you're referring yep, to? That, that, that's it. So for those who are actually administering in the, the training services, um, how do we stay ahead of the curve and that understand in advance that this is, I mean, should we, we should know enough about the industry to know that these are the positions that need to be filled uh, within hospitality, construction trades, and so forth. How are we then training and so that we can provide uh, workforce uh, immediately uh, uh, upon completion? Um, so one of the experiences that I've had and that we, we've, you know, with all the development, we have these uh, community-based agreements that we come up with with local hires and MWBs and local contractors and so forth. And it appears, at least according to some of, uh, of, of the vendors or developers, that they are not getting trained folks uh, um, from uh, the workforce developments and uh, and and uh, minimal training or not trained necessarily in the skills that they're looking for. Um, there's also a plethora of, uh, in fact, the, the hotels coming up all over the place, right? We're considering that in zoning and the rest of that, but be that as it may, um, beside the food services, um, are, are we, we're looking at career paths and, and sustainable wages and as part of the oversight, and I know we talked about living wages, but quite frankly, when you're working in the construction trades, what I have seen that all of our folks have been severely undercompensated uh, for, for even the entry level positions that they have been trained for. Um, without long-term opportunities. And so uh, I would submit that probably would require, would require greater insight and partner partnership, hands-on partnership uh, with these folks as opposed to um, an outline of what a program is going to look like. And we, we got a 12-week a, a, a draft and, and they go to the site. Uh, something more sustainable than that, a real sustainable apprenticeship. Um, I would hope that when you have uh, billions of dollars, literally, of investment in, in one local community, that we can leverage that in a way that um, we, we're not spinning our wheels. And, and I think what we came out of here is that, we're, that we want to create real living wage jobs and, and that we can keep people here in New York City. And, and, and what I'm trying to get to is, is, are we doing that? And so, and I'm telling you from my experience that there's been a lot of question 
um, around whether or not we were training folk uh, for the appropriate positions. And I get that it could be an excuse that people want to leave, use who they want to use, but I also know that there's a reason why people engage in programs, uh, employers engage in such programs because they get people on the cheap. And there's a price to be paid for the cheap. And I want to make sure that we are not complicit in doing so, that people are getting properly compensated. And again, I would ask what the oversight on these programs, on these workforce development programs were, um, whether or not we are I know in 2014 and, and subsequently we were talking about whether or not, um, we, we were talking about job retention, whether or not these were the same 100, 200 low paying jobs that were being recycled and have we gone beyond that and do we have numbers that would sustain that? I'll, I'll take the sort of system level and talk at a broad, um, from, from a citywide system level, there are a couple of things that I want to respond to. One is that in order to make sure that we are consistently attuned to employer demand, we are, through the industry partnerships primarily, in, in constant conversation and dialogue with them. And that is, that is exactly what the Career Pathways Report was about, which is that we we focus on jobs that are really there, that are growing, that are in, in sectors that are growing, and we're not sort of just like using the same industries that have always existed in New York City, and in some, in some instances actually on the downswing. So we're looking at growing industries. I think through SBS's industry partnerships, we've got a, a, a robust dialogue going on with them, and we're creating curriculum that is attuned to what the employers are saying they need. On hospitality, I, I have a particular, um, there, we've gotten requests from the hospitality industry to help work with uh, the, the state of New York on their registered apprenticeship uh, process because for hospitality, you know, most of the registered apprenticeship um, rules and regulations have been built around the trades historically, but because now more industries like tech and hospitality and manufacturing are moving into more of an apprenticeship model, they need those regulations to be sort of re, um, realigned to industries that are not the trade. So we're working with them. We've brokered conversations with the state of New York to help, and, and who are quite frankly very receptive to doing this because they understand the importance of apprenticeships, and particularly because the hospitality industry is so big and growing in New York City, it's a focus of ours to make sure that we, we are able to meet the talent needs of the hospitality industry as they grow in, in the city. So I... I I do want to stay while we're talking about apprenticeships and kind of are we taking advantage of local, even within our municipal workforce, there are uh, collective bargaining agreements that, that have apprenticeships. Um, are we taking advantage of that? Has there been any conversation between labor relations, local labor unions about that. I know that I'm a, I'm, I'm a former president and business agent and, and, and we had such an apprentice and we took mechanics and we, um, right out of high school, system mechanics trained them and ultimately they became in, uh, diesel mechanics working on trains and buses throughout the MTA. I don't see why we can't do that, take advantage of that. But also I know that there are, you have the obvious, the NYCHA apprenticeship and the construction trades. And before we let go, I want to know where that is. I know it expires at the end of the year, this year. And, 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 and in fact, we could just start with that and whether or not it's going to be uh, funded and what needs to be done between the admin and the council so that people don't get three quarters of a way through an apprentice program and then the program no longer exists. Do you, do you know where we are with that? Um, I just want to make sure I can, I, if you can clarify, are you talking about the, the memorandum of, of understanding between the I'm city about, and the building trades? Or you, uh, yeah, it was so specifically, that, yeah. specifically uh, in, in the latter instance, I'm talking about the nature 
apprentice program where they where they're doing construction in particular uh in particular the um the the uh the agreement that they have with DC9 where they do the painting and um they do other uh such work uh -huh. mold removal and 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 uh sheet rocking and so forth within NYCHA program okay uh, development okay so um, let me let me give you like a, a broader answer first and and then um maybe talk about that and specifically so the as i'm sure you are aware the the city has a memorandum of understanding with the with the building uh, uh trades unions and in it 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 um requires that new apprentices make up sorry graduates of pre-apprenticeship training programs women um residents of NYCHA uh, uh people that uh, graduate the public high school system are all um, uh, priority. 55% of the new apprenticeships each year need to, need to be people that come from those groups. And we, to complement that, we, through our construction industry partnership, fund um, uh, the, the, those union recognized pre apprenticeship training programs like um, uh, the non traditional employment for women, uh, uh, helmets to hard hats, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a core part of our um, uh, green jobs, the mayor's green jobs um, program as well. So in the past uh, three years, I want to say that we funded like 150-ish um, folks to, to, to get in and through, uh, through those programs. And we, we will continue uh, to do that in, in the coming years as well. And, and NYCHA residents in particular are a priority so, for us. So part of that. What, what I would like an answer to, where are we on the, on the um, DC-9 on apprentice the program? Um, um, that is a program that I've written a letter to the admin and most of the uh, labor committee has signed on to um, that they are three quarters through their apprenticeship and the program has, been, has not been picked up beyond December 31st, which would be an absolute travesty. Furthermore, um, I think what we were trying to get to, whether or not we were leveraging the opportunity for all the development and construction that goes on in the city, mm -hmm. and what those, uh, uh, whether or not they have uh, project labor agreements attached to them so that there is real living wage opportunities there, because quite frankly, as I said, you know, you, you work on a construction site and, 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 and you, you have these local hires simply because they're, they're hired on the cheap, they're not trained properly um first of all uh, around safety they're not compensated uh accordingly and without those are we leveraging those opportunities i'll give an example there's also um uh 1.8 billion dollars in infrastructure being done in the city in, in southeast queens mm -hmm. in my district and there is no one from the community working on those projects. We have created $2 billion in wealth for someone outside of the community. I've had this conversation with the admin, had this conversation with SBS and the deputy mayor and the other folks. We've had meetings, we've brought in contractors and, and otherwise. I think that we're really missing an opportunity. There's gonna be infrastructure work going on throughout the city forever. And, and yet, we're not leveraging it. And, and I get this is a highly skilled um, profession and trade, uh, but there's real opportunity for apprenticeships in those areas there. And we really, really have to have that conversation about how do we do that, as well as, as we, we are subsidizing all of this housing that is going on. And, and, and it is, and there is not a single, affordable developer that pays more than $15 an hour. And that is ridiculous for that work that is being done. And, and where the oversight is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm missing it. And, the, and I think there's some real long-term career paths, which I love to discuss further, um, as we move further. Um, talking about who these community partners are or who these potential corporate par partners are. Um, whether whether it's, it's technology, it's trades, it's hospitalities, whomever, um, how far we along we are with those conversations, and quite frankly, what what where the bar is on that. It is it's great that you come in and and you do this training, 
but the fact of the matter is, is something in it for them. It's subsidies, it's opportunities that, you know, I, I'm hoping it's just not the cheap labor. Right, and how do we prevent that from happening? Because everyone in business doesn't have the morals and scruples that we hope they would have. They enter into these agreements because it benefits them. And so, um, again, uh, you know, I, I kind of just want to drill down before we talk about all the great things that are happening. Are we taking advantage? Are we leveraging? And are, is there oversight on what's happening now? Because there's city subsidies all over the place. And as I said, and, and I'm not seeing um, the community benefit from it. And that is not simply Southeast Queens. Development is happening at record pace throughout the city. And we want to make sure that we're, we're taking full advantage of it. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Council Member Drum. Yes, well, we've been joined by Council Member Manchaka and Constantinidis. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, I just have a couple of questions, more really regarding um, education. I'm the Chair of the Education Committee here in the Council. And um, I noticed in Deputy Commissioner Mallon's testimony that you mentioned that um, you launched a number of trainings to prepare New Yorkers for the industrial and manufacturing jobs of the future, including a contextualized high school equivalency diploma. What does contextualized mean? Um, for the specific occupation. So uh -huh. while you're learning your high school, while you're getting the high school equivalency prep, we've, con we've worked with DOE to con contextualize um, that prep so that you're, you're, um, you're, you're beginning your, your cable installation training while you're doing your high school equivalency. Now those in District 79, those are students who are under the age of 21 uh, and they're in like basically transfer schools or a situation like that? And they're working toward their high school equivalency Correct. in most cases. Correct. Okay. And do um, you know the number of students that would be involved in, in that program? I, I, I could get um, back to you. The, the, you mean specifically in the industrial and um, manufacturing? I can totally get back to you. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind, it's a, it, we just started it. We're just you know, figuring out um, how to make it work. So, but I'd be happy to get back to you with specifics. But that was my question also, because in your testimony, the last sentence you said, we expect the program to launch in the second quarter of next year. This is a different program. You're, you're referring to the Apprentice NYC, the, the, the different than the... Well, the, the numerically controlled yeah. machinist? Yeah. Okay, so that's yeah. different. Two different things. Is that a, um, a, a, um, a, G, a, a high school equivalency diploma also there? Not to begin with, no. Oh, okay. And um, the reason I'm asking also is because um, the DOE, I, I recently did a hearing on adult education. Yeah. And with the high school um, equivalency diplomas, they're not doing such a good job. They only had 150 students get um, a high school equivalency diploma out of 28,000 students. So that's why I'm particularly interested in looking at those numbers to be able to compare what you're doing there with what the DOE is doing. That, that's in adult education, given its different circumstances, but I'm interested in, in looking at those two numbers, two sets of numbers. Okay. I'd be happy to, to follow up with you and, okay, and thank you. even sit down and talk. I'd love to, to learn from you as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And also in uh, your testimony, you mentioned the, um, the health care curriculum was uh, revised or redesigned. Can you give us some more details on that? How was it redesigned or what was the, the, the idea behind that if you sure. don't know the exact details? Sure, sure. Um, so in general, um, the shift in health care, I always feel this is, I sound so ironic every time I say this, is to a patient-centric centered model, um, which you'd think was always like that, but which means that there are a lot more frontline positions and a lot more coordination, uh, coordination among various um, healthcare specialists for your care. Um, and so um, the, 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 the principles of, of like dealing with people and issues and, and, and all um, kinds of elements related to care um, and of course, the, the, the more um, stringent things like you know, math and science and whatnot, uh, we, we work together with industry to develop a, a core competence, all the core competencies one would need in order to succeed in, in healthcare and work with the DOE to get that integrated into the CTE curriculum. So now they're in their healthcare um, uh, focused CTE schools. They're, they're, some of them are beginning to teach that. Does that make sense? Did you, I said it? Yeah, uh, as a follow up, uh, so what type of job? Title would those include that they're preparing for? Um, uh, 
medical assistant, certified nursing um, DNAs. assistant. Yeah, and nurses themselves, um, uh, peer counselors, a whole range of, of, of positions um, that, where that would be the uh, part of the fundamental skills. Do you work with the um, high school for health and sciences in uh, Newtown High School? I believe so, but I, I'd have to double check okay. the specific. Right. That's in my Again, I'd be happy to follow up with you and, and uh, give you all the details on, on, on these things and, 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 and learn from you. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, yep. it's a pleasure. Thank you, Council Member. And if I may just follow up on that before I, I know Council Members uh, Menchaca and, and Crowley also have questions. Um, but to follow up on, on Council Member Drums and, and particularly the CTEs and what's the hap what what level of education the curriculum is going on there. And I know we talked about medical assistance and so forth. When I was in high school, we kind of had dental and medical assistance. I'd like to think that we revolve, and if we have our young people in this building for four years, that we have the resources and technology to at very least uh, create respiratory technicians and, and, and things like that, to, to be able to certify and credential them in areas beyond what we were doing 25 years, and that's, being gentle 25 years ago, right? Um, that that we, we can do better. And, and I know that I've been in conversation with, with uh, UFT and CSA and others about CTE programs, as well as the trades and, and, and coming in and, and that there's been these walls that we have to knock down where there is really the will to come in and really train our young people in, in, in real career path opportunities. And we can't get there uh, because we can't navigate the minutiae of government, and that's, and, and that's bad. And, and speaking of which, is there, so um, is Health and Hospital a, a partner in any way? And do, do they do apprenticeships, or are they a partner in any of the CTEs? Um, well, two different two different things, and I just want to, for the record, I, 25 years ago is probably generous <laughs> for me to have been in high school as well. But <laughs> just to, the medical assistant uh, is one of the highest uh, demand and growing occupations. It's changed a lot. The actual job has changed a lot since mm -hmm. the. So just to be fair on that point, um, partnership with with health and hospitals, and and recently work with them to develop a a. a, a certified peer specialist, um, somebody who works with, with people in recovery. Um, but that's not the, not, uh, the same as our partnership with, with DOE and, and the work we've been doing in CTE. So for, I don't know if you have a, a broader sense of, of whether Health and Hospitals has a, a partnership with CTE, because I don't know that. I do not know. Okay. Don't, don't know. Uh, Most, uh, and so I, I would hope that, that we go back and we, we kind of we investigate and that we really encourage them to, to invest in our young people and, and, uh, and the future of their workforce, considering um, where the uh, city workforce is, is in, 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 that, in, in the next five years, probably two-thirds will be able to walk out the door. And we want to make sure that we're cultivating, developing that next generation of worker in, in all these different professions. Um, uh, Councilmember Crowley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks for having this important hearing. Uh, I have uh, two questions. First, I just want to follow up on your question earlier. I don't think we got uh, uh, an answer from your offices as to where the city is with the NYCHA apprentice program that does painting in the, uh, you know, it puts residents to work on much needed projects that, you know, all these buildings are in disrepair. We need to be doing all we can to bring them up to code and certainly making sure that uh, the units and the buildings receive painting from this program that the city was in partnership with both the mayor's office and the council, uh, it doesn't have the funding, as far as I know, after January 1st. Do you know if the city plans to continue funding these needed uh, jobs? So I'll, I'll say that our colleagues at NYCHA are really the ones who are best positioned to answer that question, and we will get back to you on that. We, I definitely um, know about the closing of this program. We were, we were very, very concerned, and I think it really is a question that we need to engage NYCHA with. So we will get back to you on that. Second question I have is about the film industry. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
it, it seems more and more uh, films or more and more TV production, film production is happening in our communities throughout the city, which is great. It, it looks, you know, it's helping to strengthen our local economy. But what is uh, your office is doing to work with this industry to make sure that New Yorkers have an opportunity uh, in these various different traits? It seems like it's complicated to understand how you can gain access if you want to be a production assistant or if you want to work on the sets. And I know most of these jobs are union jobs, but you know I don't know how to um, help city residents gain access. And so uh, I'd like to know more about what you're doing to, to bridge that uh, opportunity. Okay. I can uh, tell you uh, about some of the work that we're doing with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Um, and specifically, we have uh, several programs that we've recently developed. Um, there, there's the, the production assistant program that's been around for a while. Um, and we've sort of uh, built a, a succession to that, which is a, a production assistant uh, program with a local community uh, a partner where we're taking people who have been successful as a production assistant and, and um, putting them uh, through a, a series of trainings, including like, the, I can't remember the specific name of the software, but you need to be good at a certain <laughs> software, um, and, and some on-the-job training uh, with a, another uh, production person. Um, so that's one. Uh, we also have, have did a, another program, all of these in partnership with the Mayor's Office of, of Media and Entertainment, um, which was a, a, a screenwriter's uh, apprenticeship, essentially, um, internship um, type of program where uh, hundreds of people um, applied and got uh, some support from um, experienced and, and um, uh, successful screenwriters, and uh, a few more got uh, actually, um, I don't know, I, internships is my, the word that's coming to mind. Uh, where they worked one on one with a screenwriter um, for six months uh, or so in order to, to uh, in hopes of launching a production uh, here in New York City and diversifying the, the, the screenwriters. Um. You know, there's a, a few unions that aren't within the areas you mentioned, yeah. right? And there, I believe, outside of the high school of film, in the industry that's in Long Island City, I'm not say, I'm sure if I'm saying it correctly, there needs to be more opportunities for pre-apprenticeship to, to feed into the union jobs mm -hmm. that are the stagehand type of jobs that pay very well and are not the traditional, uh, you know, uh, production assistant yeah. or screenwriting. Those are the real jobs that uh, there are so many of them that we need to uh, build some type of pre-apprentice program for. So I, I urge uh, both of your offices to, to look into this more and help uh, to create more access for New Yorkers. Um, one, one thing that I can say is that we, uh, in fact, tomorrow I'm going to be heading over to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We've got a great partnership with the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the expansion of Steiner Studios is underway. Um, we are going to be convening, you know, what we're interested in is how do we engage the NYCHA community around the yard to, in jobs that are being created by the yard at pretty uh, a pretty fast clip and so one of the things that we're discussing is convening employers including Steiner to understand better what positions are opening up as they begin to uh, populate and, and offer more uh, opportunities for New Yorkers and how those match the current skills of NYCHA residents and how can we make strategic investments in training NYCHA residents to become eligible for those jobs. Good so is another NYCHA program You'll work with NYCHA to do this type of pre-apprentice, and, and you'll fund it, too? Or, I mean... <laughs> well, I, I it, think... It seems interesting, Yeah, right? I mean, like, I, I, it's an idea, NYCHA, but you really need to put funding behind uh, the idea and make it a real plan that uh, you could then be able to get people jobs. Yeah, and the only I mean, way I, to do I, that I, is really through... Uh, either working with the various different employers to do a wage subsidy type of program where they could learn on the job, or put, in, put students who want to learn the trades, because there are many different trades, uh, into uh, a program where they're going to be in class and employers are involved as well, and they're going to guarantee some <coughs> access to jobs. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we are right now in the middle of doing is we're, we're it's, it's early sort of... Um, 
due diligence to understand what these jobs are and then putting together the right program where we can then move to see, seek funding for those programs. But at this point, I think it's premature to probably get funding for a program that we aren't really sure what we're talking about yet. So we're getting there, though. We're okay. definitely focused. Well, it's on a that. good idea. Hopefully, uh, you could put a solid plan together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. No further questions. Th thank you, Council Member. That was insightful, and I knew you'd okay. pick us up on the uh, on the uh, labor issues. So appreciate you, Council Member Machaka. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for having this uh, joint hearing, and uh, welcome back. Uh, it's always great to talk to you in the office about the good work that you're doing. Uh, I have a few questions, just to better a better to better ground me in some either data or point us into some directions for the next session that we're about to start uh, next calendar year. And one, I, I, I want to get a better sense about, uh, in your testimony, you, you point to the jobs of the future. And I want to get a sense about how you define the jobs of the future. I think that was your, my, your question for me, yeah? Yeah. Um, well, we start with, with industry. Um, we have the five industry partnerships, and um, we are in close connection with them and working with them to try to understand uh, as best we can um, what the, the their needs, as far as they can tell, what their needs are going to be moving forward, and and um, you know work from there. Also look at economic trends and all, all that kind of stuff. So industry, and and I kind of got a sense from the industry. There, there's a lot of different industry, but you have a you have a task force, you have a group of people that you go to right now. For each industry that we're focused on. So can you tell me a little bit about, about um, from that analysis, how you're defining the jobs of the future? It sounds like, so here's, here's the, I guess, sure. what I'm, what I'm kind of seeing as, as a blind spot. We're going to companies that are growing right now, that are in a peak moment where there are a lot of jobs. Uh, you mentioned hospitality and food services are two different areas where, where jobs are growing. But... Uh, I'm just kind of thinking about the last four years and kind of the multiple hearings that we're having about about stuff that we're not we're we're just beginning to think about in the world of technology, driverless cars. Yep. There are things that are on their way that won't have an industry partner relationship because that industry isn't here yet, and we're not necessarily preparing for that. Yep. And so that's that's what I'm trying to understand: is are we really talking about jobs of the future, or are we talking about the peak jobs today, which are not the future, that'll be the past very soon, and and we're going to have a wave of of industry that that has yet to yet yet to even uh, blossom yet, but we know are on their way. That that's what I'm trying to understand and discern here from from your group of people that you go search, understand, respond, invest, and then connect job seekers to mm -hmm. training. So so great question and things that keep us up at night is thinking about the jobs for the future that on jobs that aren't even here yet. Um, there is a lot of conversation going on, not only in New York City, but also on a global level of what is the impact of automation on jobs generally in different countries, in New York City. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a conversation that's getting a lot of play. We have engaged um, a number of employers who are engaged at the World Economic Forum to talk about what is the impact of what they're seeing globally in New York City. And so what we're looking at is what kinds of jobs are more prone to being sort of automated and what jobs are more likely to be growing. We're, we're engaging with those um, employers to, um, and, and also connecting them with the Department of Ed and CUNY as they're looking at their curriculum in terms of foundational skills that are going to be needed in order to compete for the jobs that are coming on that we don't even know what we're talking about yet. So, I mean, a lot, what we do know is that it's a lot of STEM uh, conversation that's going on. We also know that a lot of administrative kinds of jobs and retail and um, sort of like, you know, grocery uh, checkout jobs are probably uh, on their way out. And so what are we doing in order to skill up not only the current um, adults that are in the system, but also the future of, of our workforce, which is right now they're in the K through 12 and in the CUNY system. But we're definitely in that conversation. So it sounds like it's the conversation is happening. How is that impacting the work um, at the city level and the administration level to start preparing for that? Because yeah, I think I think a lot of people are having those conversations, but they're not necessarily having impact in the day to day in the way that I think another question that I wanted to ask was. 
out of the chart, the pie chart of investment. And I think our numbers are showing that there are, uh, well, an increase of 500, 500 million in 14 to 606 in 16. Uh, we'd like to know what, what that number is today as far as the, in, the work services, workforce services are, and that's a whole bunch of um, categories of tax, uh, city tax, the council dollars, uh, what well, that city tax, private resources, and others. What are we at now, and how much of that is is being geared towards instruction in these jobs for the future that we just that you just mentioned? I just want to I just wanted to add one uh, point that I think uh, addresses your, and point of clarification. In fact, the industry partnerships that we have established, um, sure, they they are some of the the output of the work that they're currently doing are new training models that get developed and replicated, but actually the the longer term goal and what we're really striving to do is to establish them so that they are directly connected with the people that do um, the that's people the organizations that do uh, training and skills building directly so that whenever things evolve there, the connection exists and uh, industry is informing uh, education and training providers like real time it'll take some you know time before we get there but that's the ultimate goal it's not a it's, you know what I mean? So that we can be prepared and be ready. Be, we will never be ready, obviously, for a brand new industry that we can't foresee. But changes to industries, like you mentioned, um, uh, self driving cars, that's a transportation. We have a transportation industry partnership. The dialogue is going to be about that. And if the connection is there, we should be able to, to you know, respond to it uh, more effectively. So, so you're just talking relationships that are being built right now so that there's conversation. But how is that? And I just help me understand are we also talking about educational um, yes. uh, facilities or, or uh, infrastructure that you're saying is, is out there right now that can help transition so that you're, you're so tell me understand that yeah, part. so if, if that's for me I'll the most you, important that's how I understand it that's how I think about it as yep. a council member in a district where there are organizations that are currently trying to do that right now but if they're not connected to a larger brain like yours that's trying to think about these things that we're talking about today uh, and having funding and having relationships, then we're gonna. There's gonna be a big gap. Yep. No. Understood. Um, so I mean, I can give you a concrete example that would that would um, bring it to light. So, in, in healthcare, um, a lot of the, the the work that we're doing now through NIACH, the New York Alliance for Careers in Healthcare, which is our industry partnership, is getting um, all of the, the emerging needs and occupations that healthcare providers, uh, sorry, employers are citing as, as new and, and different. And so um, we're working with, with the CUNY system so that we can inform them, but also uh, working to establish a longer term connection so that moving forward sometime in the future, and it will take a while because these things do, <laughs> will have moved the system so that as an example, you know, CUNY will be directly connected to these employers and will be responsive. So they won't need, you know, necessarily another entity or us to make the, to broker the relationship. We'll have succeeded in this ongoing and continuous feedback loop. It's just an example, but, and we would aim to do that, um, you know, systematically, you know, for all of the, the entities that provide uh, uh, training and education and do skills building. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, and I, I can just add that it's, it's, you know, training for jobs that currently don't exist is probably not something, I mean, from a, from a hardcore <laughs> occupational training perspective, we want to stay current, right? We want to make sure that their jobs are out there when, when these folks graduate. What we're hearing from the folks that are, again, having more sort of global conversations is that it's not so much about the actual occupational skill, which we're going to obviously be focused on, but the foundational baseline understanding of what kinds of skills are going to be needed regardless of what kinds of job you're going to get. So critical thinking skills, add, uh, you know, continuing to learn, those kinds of, of foundational um, sort of values that you bring into your job is going to be what works in the next jobs in the, in the future, because these things are changing so rapidly that by the time you enter CUNY today but, and, and you exit, you, you might actually be obsolete in, your, in the actual occupational skill that you're learning. So you've got to learn how to continue to learn and to sort of really sharpen those skills when you're in the workplace and continue to sort of, um, you know, be as agile as the, as the uh, jobs are going to uh, come through. So 
That's what we're hearing. Got it. Well, I, I have a lot more questions, and we should sit down and, and just kind of think sure. a little bit more about about that and and then everything every time I think we've ever spoken and I, so I don't want to not not mention it in, in a public hearing like this but thinking about uh, communities that that you're focused on low-income communities but also thinking about communities that have other barriers to jobs like language uh, and making sure that we we invest we, we continue to invest in adult education courses that are about um, moving people through uh, an English English language learning uh, curriculum that can also be jobs and uh, intense and skill train training and that's where I feel like Sunset Park is going to be a place where where if we get it right there we're going to get it right in, in the whole city and there, there's a lot of opportunity there that we can that we can focus on um, and other things like the laws that we've just passed 1447 a uh, C where we can look at an instruction that's on its way that we're going to have to retrain uh, an entire industry soon. And that's an educational opportunity where, where we can build a relationship there too in case things change in the future, uh, even within construction. So this is a big task, no doubt, but I think it's up to us as a city to think about this, to invest in it, um, and not get caught off guard when whole industries will just, the whole bottom will fall out and we're going to have we're going to have thousands of people out of work and 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 figuring out how we how we how we respond to that how we think about it and anticipate it uh, so that it's a good and just response for all our communities uh, that we represent in New York City. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Council Member. Uh, so on behalf of again of my colleague. Uh, Councilmember Carnegie, I'd like to ask a few more questions, but specifically about, uh, are, in, in terms of the workforce development, is there any uh, MWBE investment that has been done there, and what does that look like? I don't know. I'm sorry, could, did you, could you just clarify that In question? terms of workforce development, has there been any investment in MWBE? And MWBE's development uh, and, and, and training uh, to do training as well as um, so we've identified and, and I'm going to see if we can break this down a little bit. We've identified a number of industries that may or may not have but we, we, we've not exploited as of yet. I know sitting here a few years ago, I, I mentioned that we've had uh, uh, conversations with. Um, uh, the JFK bid around logistics and 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 the fact that they there was uh, uh, a lot of employment opportunity there and that they could not necessarily because of transportation options or lack thereof recruit in a way that they wanted to and that the local people did not have the local residents did not have the skill sets that were necessary which which kind of creates a natural synergy for for community and, and bridges and things like that and we put that out but that have yet to manifest itself in so many different ways and and I think one of the things is that when when there's a lack of understanding of these communities and what the communities what natural resources exist within those communities like uh, demographically being between the airports and or the local development that is going on the waterfronts in Red Hook, how do we capture that and whether or not folks from outside of the community are recognizing the indigenous opportunities that exist. Um, and so that gets us back to our MWB investment. Um, if any, if there's none. So I'm just trying to figure, are you... I'm sorry, I just want to clarify. Are you asking, are we, in terms of workforce development, are we, do we have any specific offerings that are tailored to meet the needs of MWB employers? Is that what you're? And, and, and no, employers and training opportunities, because so, MWBs yes. also are engaged in workforce development as well. Um, so have we reached out, or oh. are there any? within the industry of the 21 are any MWBE? I see. You're asking are, are any of our providers MWBE mm -hmm. firms? Um, I would have to uh, come back to you on that. Um, it, you're talking about training providers and the, and the operators of our of our. Is there any investment there? in MWBE uh, employees or vendors? Sorry, say again? Uh, uh, employers as well, or, or any of those MWBEs? What kind of investment are we doing locally? Because the MWBs are more apt to hire locally than, than others. 
All right, so um, that would be a question there. Um, so at least one of our our uh, workforce one career center providers is, an, is a certified MWBE. Um, they have two contracts, I think. But I can get I can get back to you with more specifics on uh, on the rest of them and in, in our training providers because that I don't know off the top. How of many and, and, and how many of the vendors are local vendors? Um, that one is, um, and in, and again, I'm. Sp- specifically responding to the question about the career center context because yes. that's what I have mm-hmm. in my head. I think it's one of three, right? Two or, yeah. Local was in New York City. Uh, as in New York City, yeah. One, so one the of other three. 18 come from outside of no, New no, York City? No, uh, no. Uh, vendors operate more than one location. Hmm. So there, are, there are currently uh, three, How many in- three um, organizations operate the 21 centers bet- between ah, them. And of the three? One, for sure, one of three is New York, both MWB and New York City-based. And the other two? I have to, I'm not sure, I can't, are operates, not. Operates, are not. you know how many, first, well, how, the, 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 the New York City-based MWB, how many do they operate? Uh, like a third of the system. It's, it's pretty much okay. a third, a third, a third. All right. So um, okay. and I, I, I do want I have a follow-up uh, to the council member, but I think we've kept you here long enough, and uh, we, um, I, I think we have a meeting coming up with, with, with the commissioner and your group in the very near future, so we will have that. And certainly there are more questions that the committee has that we'll forward to you, and hopefully we'll have an answer before our next meeting, and then we can address that. But really look forward to continuing to working with you on this very, very important issue um, and an opportunity, making sure that we're really leveraging these opportunities. And I think that there's a lot of ideas here, you know, up on this days here, and, and hopefully, uh, we can work collaboratively to make sure that we make those ideas a reality, that we can really take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. So thank you. Terrific. We'll thank call, you. Call the next panel. Do you want to do that? In addition to the dean, do you want to do these two in addition? Mm-mm. Just tell you now? Yep. Okay. Do five and Three, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what? Let's get this call. Okay. Okay. The next panel. Uh, Sterling Robinson, VP, CTE, UFT. Alex Gleason from New York City Central Labor Council. Christian Gonzalez, Center for, uh, Center for Our Urban Future. And Stephanie Calls. Project Renewal. It's always cold. Based on uh, whose testimony I have in hand. Okay, thank you so much. And I think I now have them all, so. Uh, You want to start at this end? Doesn't matter. Okay, now that I have Mr. Uh, Sterling's uh, testimony in my hand, you may as well start there, right? Well, good morning. Councilmember, is it on? Oh, it's not. 
close enough. How's that? Excellent. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity for me to testify on behalf of the United Federation of Teachers. My name is Sterling Robeson, Vice President for Career and Technical Education High Schools uh, for the UFT. Um, on behalf of um, uh, President Michael Mulgrew and all of the 200,000 members we represent and officers, it's great to be here uh, to speak on to the uh, Committee on S Civil Service and Labor and um, talk about um, regarding uh, career pathways and workforce. Now, my testimony, um, I'm not going to read it verbatim. Um, you have it in front of you. I'm going to highlight it. Um, and really thinking about the importance of uh, career and technical education as part of um, the One New York plan. When the plan was released, part of that plan was the expansion and strengthening of career and technical education in New York City. Um, one of the things that we have been doing and advocating for and working with the Department of Education on is strengthening CTE across the city. Um, currently, when we look at the, the scope of CTE, we have approximately uh, 47 designated CTE schools. We have close to 300 programs um, and about 130 academic high schools. The reason why that's significant is because the focus areas in that expansion is in many of the fields um, that the city administration talked about, healthcare, technology, um, industrial manufacturing, construction, retail, food services. But the goal of career and technical education is to ensure that our young people have a career pathway to um, mid-skilled jobs, that they are able to um, gain skills needed to um, be successful in today's knowledge, knowledge economy. So it's important that um, we work collaboratively to provide um, a infrastructure so that individuals can benefit and have access and opportunity to those programs. So in terms of um, CTE in New York City, in terms of those growth industries, obviously we created um, more career and technical education um, schools. We highlighted the one in um, Long Island City where we talked about um, that's connected to television and film. Um, if we look at some of the workforce development that has been done, like in the borough of the Bronx, which has health care services, we have a school called Hero Health Education Research Opportunity opportunity schools. Each one of these um, schools are themed to focus on areas um, that we know are um, booming sectors in New York. Um, obviously, we've also put together in New York City a, an advisory council that is uh, made up of volunteer industry folks, as well as higher education partners, so that we are not just creating programs, but we are really creating an, a, an authentic pathway for um, young people. So in a school, when you have a career and technical education program, the program is not only um, supported by industry that signs off on um, the program, it's also approved by the city as well as the state. Um, so with that being said, um, what I can say is that we need to continue um, in our effort to be able to provide opportunities for many of our young people and create the kinds of pathways that we know that um, leads to uh, jobs where um, many of our folks can um, provide for their families. But moving forward, one key thing I want to make sure that I leave with is leave um, the members with is that we also have to do a major focus on how do we deal with um, many of our uh, populations that are like um, students with disabilities, English language learners. We have to do as much as we've made many gains, we still have some work to do in those particular areas so that we can provide opportunities for all New Yorkers, um, especially many of our um, populations that need our support. So thank you very much for allowing me to testify. Okay. Okay, good morning, uh, Chair Miller uh, and uh, Council Member Perkins. Uh, so my name is Christian Gonzalez Rivera, uh, and I'm a senior researcher at the Center for an Urban Future. Uh, we're an independent, nonpartisan uh, research organization based here in Manhattan that generates uh, sustainable public policies to reduce inequality and increase economic opportunity. Uh, for more than 20 years, uh, the center has focused on skill building uh, and, uh, and jobs, you know, publishing reports on subjects ranging from the importance of ESOL to adult basic education uh, and workforce development. As you know, uh, we published the, uh, the first independent assessment of career pathways uh, a year after it was, it was established. And since then, uh, we also published reports on how the workforce uh, system could better serve 
New York's immigrant, immigrant workers, and also on the challenges that small businesses face in um, connecting to the workforce development system. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, as you know, uh, Career Pathways um, is, is a strategy for boosting economic opportunity that really works for New York. Uh, in the past, you know, workforce development has relied on placing as many people into jobs as possible with little regard for quality or fit. But to its credit, the de Blasio administration has acknowledged that human capital development is one of the most important factors in ensuring economic opportunity uh, for New Yorkers, um, and also set about creating a blueprint for how New York might achieve, um, might really create a human capital development system that works. Um, but our research has shown that there, there are some serious barriers to implementation that could really derail the momentum that has been built. Uh, and I'll mention five of those recommendations very briefly. Um, you have fuller descriptions in the, written descri in the written testimony in front of you. Um, but the first is really that we need to fully fund career pathways with local city funds, at least at the levels that are indicated in the report. So as you know, you know New York City really can't count on federal support right now, uh, and the state has been way too slow to act. Um, and while phil private philanthropic funds have driven a lot of innovation in the field, scaling up models that work in workforce development will take a concerted effort from the city to provide funding that is flexible, and this is very crucial, you know, funding that is flexible and attuned, in, in, uh, crucially, to the demands of New York's entrepreneurial uh, workforce development providers. And that's something that's currently not happening with, uh, with, public, uh, with publicly available funds. Um, the, second, uh, the second recommendation is that some of that funding needs to be set aside for rigorous evaluation of programs and setting up of research infrastructure. And this is no small thing. I mean, it's, you know, just last week, uh, the Center for an Urban Future held a forum uh, where we asked five respected leaders in the workforce community what would it take to really scale up what works in workforce development. I mean, to really serve more people with effective programs. And one of the th main themes that came out is that there's not enough rigorous research that really shows what works and then how to scale up what works. I mean, it's like there's just not the information there. Um, as a result, public contracts too often end up going to organizations that produce the best RFPs, not necessarily the ones that are actually producing the best models. Um, and because federal funding and you know, a, a lot of local funding is not well suited to the needs of um, the most effective programs, there are many providers that are choosing just not to play with the city at all, to just not accept public programs. And this, of course, is a crisis when we're talking about how to uh, scale up a programs at work. Very quickly, um, the next thing that needs to happen is, is uh, to ensure that providers have incentives to work with small businesses. Right now, it's a business that's based on volume, how many people you can place into jobs. But the fact is that small businesses don't, can't always hire 30 or 40 people at a time. I mean, they can't always hire in large volumes, so they're really being left out of the workforce system. And this is a very, very big issue because, of course, small businesses are where the growth is in New York City's economy. Industry partnerships need to be made accountable. That's something that, you know, of course, I mean, there was the whole conversation we just had now. Um, you know, one of the toughest jobs for workforce development providers, you know, whether they're nonprofits or for profits, is to connect with employers. And industry partnerships were created by Career Pathways exactly to do that. Um, yet they're largely being operated in the dark by, by SBS. I mean, it's, you know, some of what we learned today is, is information that is coming out to the public for the first time. So accountability is a huge issue when it comes to, uh, to industry partnerships because they're really the linchpin of career pathways. Without that employer connection, the, uh, the workforce development system is really left afloat. Um, and you know, when we did our, our independent evaluation two years ago, this is what we found. And it's still the case today, two years later. So this is a big issue. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Alex Gleason, and I'm the policy associate at the New York City Central Labor Council of the AFL-CIO. This is my colleague, Aaron Darcy, who's the government affairs director at the Consortium for Worker Education. We represent 1.3 million workers across 300 affiliated unions and advocate for lifting the floor on standards and wages for all workers in New York City. The Central Labor Council's workforce development arm, the Consortium for Worker Education, or CWE, operates programs positively impacting every neighborhood and tens of thousands of workers annually. And this is only one example of the many that the labor movement has to show how the floor can be lifted. The Consortium for Worker Education provides a range of workforce development programs through their more than 30 community-based organizations and its 29 union partnerships. One program in particular, 
Jobs to Build On, is funded in part by the City Council and has trained more than 14,400 individuals while placing 19,000 in jobs with an average wage of $14 per hour. Last year alone, Jobs to Build On created and tracked over 2,000 placements. Connecting workers with classes, skills, and certifications, Jobs to Build On places workers on track for in-demand positions with opportunities for training and career ladders. CWE trains tens of thousands of other workers through a multitude of programs across industries. One industry the labor movement is particularly equipped to train and prepare workers for is in construction. A unionized apprenticeship program is only successful when there is a pipeline of work to grow and expand market share. This is made possible through rigorous safety and licensing standards, as well as successful labor management partnerships. Fundamentally, this is controlled by standards government places on projects. Development is a vehicle for economic opportunity that can have long-run benefits. As local hire and pipelines to apprenticeship have been established and implemented, the city's communities and tax base benefit. According to the Economic Policy Institute, minorities accounted for 61.8% of all city residents' union apprenticeships, and black construction workers earned 36.1% more than black non-union construction workers. This goes directly back into communities most in need of investment and development. Union training and standards are not only anti-poverty tools, but positive contributors to the neighborhood multiplier effect. The labor movement has already built the infrastructure to train and connect workers with careers. It is specifically our job. The New York City labor, Central Labor Council and Consortium for Worker Education are prepared to collaborate in any ways that connect workers with education and training necessary to succeed in the workplace. And we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Gleason. So um, we talked. To, uh, uh, we did say we'd get back to data and, and, and accountability. And one of the questions that we did not get to ask was uh, was the tracking and placement statistics uh, of the industries. Was whether it was done by industry, um, whether it was done by borough and demographics. Um, how do you gather data on, on job placement around the city? Yeah. That's correct. Do you have your mic? Uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, we, we ourselves, I mean, it's like do not gather this data on, on placement. I mean, this is something that the city uh, does. So, mm -hmm. do, does do, do, do the vendors providing these services, do, where do we access that information? So, you would have to ask uh, SBS for, for all of the, the placement that's done through, through Workforce One. And then there's also placement that's done by individual nonprofits. Um, and that's work that you'd have to ask specifically the, uh, th those nonprofits for that information. Okay. Um, is that information readily available? Have it been difficult to obtain that? I think you said uh, you started your testimony by saying what the first issue was uh, lack of access to, to this data. Yes, I mean, and one, one of the biggest issues here is, is that when we think about the workforce development system, it's not just one agency. It's six different agencies, and it's not just one, you know, a few organizations. It's dozens and dozens of organizations. All of them collect different information. Those that are publicly funded uh, deliver that information to, uh, to public agencies. Those that are not may deliver it to their own funders. All this data is collected in different ways, and it's not always possible to connect. I mean, it's you know, one piece of data with another piece of data, depending on, on, on who it's delivered to. Uh, so one of the biggest challenges here is really having some kind of common metrics that show what exactly is the workforce system pro uh, producing, um, who is being helped, how are they being helped, and what are really the, me the, the metrics that make sense. And right now, we don't really have those common metrics. Although, part of the work around career pathways was exactly to do that, develop common metrics that wouldn't be able to do, show based that. Based on the testimony of the administration, do you feel that, that, do you feel any better about the data that you received this morning? <laughs> well, it's good that we received some information, so, you know, definitely thank you for holding this hearing. Um, but, of course, I mean, we need ongoing accountability. I mean, it, it's not something that should happen once every few years. Um, because, basically, the workforce system, the, the big picture here 
is that when we're thinking about a human capital development system, right? I mean, it's like those of us here who had the benefit of, you know, like I did, I mean, it's like going to four years of college. My human capital development system was high school to college to grad school. But the fact is, I mean, it's like if you don't go to a four-year college, there's not really a system for you. There isn't a human capital development system for you. So here we've been talking about different programs, different initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all big, these are all small pieces of what really is a large human capital development system that is not, doesn't yet exist. You know, basically, if you don't have four years of college, there's not really a, a cohesive system for you. And what we really need is to know all these different programs, how are they working together to really move the needle on skills building for those people that, you know, don't have that. that so I would system. disagree. I would say that civil service was that, that, that had it been in the past, considering that there's uh, over 305 uh, em city employees there that simply take an exam and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, have a career, uh, but even that has not been developed over the last few, and encouraged over the last few years that we have actually gotten away from that, and 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 certainly there's great benefits to that as well. Um, Mr. Robinson, um, one of the CTEs. I know we we have uh, Benjamin Franklin and and high schools of sciences right in the district, and and. Um, I want you, I know you and I have had conversations about potential CTEs in the district and its value and, and bringing them in, but have been able to jump through those hoops to, to make it a reality. Um, and, and for those programs that have come in, and this kind of speaks to what you were saying about uh, uh, data and, and, and vendors and those who are providing services um, and, and whether or not they are up to snuff. So we have one program, the technologies program, we, uh, uh, and, and on a campus that has four schools in it, and, 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 and in this particular campus, the technologies program uh, between ResOA and council funding and DOE funding. Um, so we have them up and running, but we have one classroom that lacks computers, the other classroom has the computers, uh, but it's not wired. The other one, uh, and the other one is wired, has computers, and has air condition that is necessary as well, right? So even when we make the investment, we don't have the type of coordination. What kind of real commitment is that when we can't, when, when council can come up with dollars, DOE can do certain things, and, and but we can't, put three classrooms together to make this a reality, considering the amount of investments that have already been made. Is this typical? I think it's typical in the sense that um, anytime you are coordinating from various entities, it sometimes becomes a challenge to um, execute things um, uh, fully through. I think one of the things and one of the lessons that we've learned is that we've we've done a lot of investment in terms of um, the hardware, in terms of technology, but um, we may not have anticipated how rapidly um, broadband connectivity was going to move us. Right, just like we spent a lot over the years in buying um, buying computers and disk and and DVDs, and now everything's moving towards cloud base. Right, so the challenge for um, any educational institution institution is how do you keep up? So even though you make those investments, um, it's really about how do we um, try to anticipate where the industry is going. I mean, we, we, we do that in terms of labor market industries, but it's one thing about the technology, uh, and then there's the next thing about um, what we need to do to sort of put the infrastructure together so that um, it is successful and you don't have these impediments to progress. So. So, and, and I would say, and one this year would be their first graduating class, so I, I wouldn't anticipate that they've become antiquated in, in four years in, in right. that manner. Um, but in terms of, of, of partnerships, what, what does the CTE partnership look like, okay. whether it's with the trades or other corporate sponsorships okay. uh, and partnerships that exist as well? I know that. Um, on the on on the advisory board mm -hmm. of 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 uh, of uh, for workforce development, we have groups like LinkedIn and Facebook mm -hmm. and, and and other folks like that. But I am not 
have not seen whether or not they actually have uh, apprenticeships or other programs that actually facilitate employment locally. I, what I've seen, and perhaps there's more data out there, is that the, the, they, they kind of have more of a national and an international workforce and that they're, they're not investing in, in local uh, communities uh, that they're in. And I think that we've seen that with a number of, of companies in, in the city here. How do we get around that? And then how is, is there, in fact, any such partnerships that exist within the DOE? So in um, New York City, um, there is what is known as a uh, Career and Technical Education Advisory Council. Um, that council is a, is a separate entity from the department. It makes recommendations. Um, it's, it's made up of volunteer business folks um, from a variety of industry. Um, part of the chair lead is, is a partnership for New York, Kathy Wiles Group, as well as small businesses, there's higher ed education folks that, that sit on that committee. And um, one of the things that they do is they connect directly uh, to the schools um, based on their industry. Um, the commission is broken up, um, but the advisory is, it has commissions. So there's an advisory council, and then there's um, specific uh, commissions that deal with um, today's industry. So there's a healthcare commission, there's an IT commission, there's a um, hospitality tourism, there's a commission for each one of those areas. So they guide and help schools um, as well as um, educators and administrators what exactly um, what's happening in the industry. How do they review curricula? How do they look at how we assess where students are? What are the employability skills that they're looking at? So we work with the industries to actually develop um, uh, a, a cohesive um, ecosystem that allows for that career pathway for um, that child to be successful. So that, and then that advisory report is key in our area because without their expertise and knowledge, as well as providing work-based learning opportunities that's correct connected to the curricula. So if you're in automotive and you're working with the uh, Greater New York Automobiles Dealers Association, knowing where the jobs are located, working with the, the dealers so that you know that there's some outcome at the end of that um, education for the young person. Interesting about that, that we have a kind of a, one of those uh, auto tech schools in, in the district. Mm -hmm. And after about eighteen thousand dollars in tuition, and 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 uh, they were not providing the prescribed man hours, uh, or the prescribed technical hours, in order for them to move on to an apprenticeship. I, I, do, do, obviously, we're taking a look at that in advance that in order for you to qualify, you have to have X amount of tool hours, whatever, for whatever right. industry there is, is that, that there is oversight on this. Obviously, they're a, a private organization. So, Council Member, if I may just add, what you're describing is, is not unique just to that industry. It's something that, and Aaron, might speak, be able to speak more to this, but it seems to me that intermediaries are constantly being created to do workforce development where there are already successful programs at place and that the small amount of dollars that are actually at the discretion of the city through various programs are, could be used putting people through the already existing intermediaries rather than creating their own, especially when the intermediary is being created are connecting folks to jobs that frankly don't have the same sort of career ladders that existing programs already have, or relationships, or instructors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's, like you're talking about the most egregious symptom of it, right, which are these sort of predatory for-profit schools that are teaching people, many of which the same skills that a union apprenticeship would teach for free. Mm -hmm. But there are other examples of that as well in, in practically every industry. Okay, I want to, yes, yeah, cool. of course, uh, Council Member Perkins. So this, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> how, how are we being accountable for this, these, these trainings that are going nowhere? So I could speak to, um, the one thing that happened last year is, um, I, and I can recognize um, 
uh, Councilman Drum on the Education Committee where they held hearings um, in New York City around career and technical education for oversight where they now are required to report the, um, the status of the number of kids in programs, where the programs are located. It gives the full um, entire landscape of what we're doing within the city of those programs. This way um, there's transparency as it relates to who's being impacted, what communities are deficient, where do, should we put resources to expand some of those programs so on the education side of um, what we're doing in career and technical education. The council um, has been instrumental in being able to create an oversight through a bill to be able to do that. So I think that has become important and it moves our, um, our school system in a, in a way where um, it's, it's more cohesive. So how do we, how do we get better informed about What's working and what's not working? What's being accountable and what's not being accountable? I mean, part of, part of what's really needed um, is to make sure that in every contract um, that, sorry, for, for workforce development services, part of the money is actually going to evaluation and, and, and data collection. Um, and that's, uh, that's part of the issue that's not happening now. I mean, it's like very often public contracts are actually underfunded. I mean, it's like well, there's actually not enough money to even for, for providers to actually do the work that they need to do, let alone collect data, let alone then contract with an evaluator to find out whether what they're doing is, is working. Um, so on the private foundation side, I mean, it's like organizations that are lucky enough to get funding from foundations actually do have that. I mean, it's like where foundations do want to know detailed information about how the program's working, for whom it's working, demographics of the people um, that are going through the program, and all of this. But on the public side, that's not as much um, present. Um, and so that's one of the issues that really needs to be, really, really needs to be looked at. Yeah. So what is your suspicion of the, f of the shortcoming? Why the, uh, well, well, there's a shortcoming you're, you're, you're analyzing, and I'm just wondering, what, 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 why is that the case? Where, where the shortcomings are? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 fact, the fact is that when you have a program that's not funded at a level where you could, you're able to have instructors that are at the very highest quality, where you're able to uh, have wraparound services for people, because it's not just the skills building part, but of course, you know, people face a lot of life issues that uh, also infringe on their ability to be able to get the skills they need to be competitive in the labor force. When you don't have the ability to, to provide those supports, that's a problem. Once you place somebody into a job, if you don't have the ability to be able to follow up with that person and also with their supervisors to be able to say, if there are any issues, please call us. Um, you know, to be able to, to basically smooth out that transition between the skills part and actually placing someone into a job. If you don't have the, uh, the funding to be able to do that, then that's another place where, um, where the, the process of connecting people to jobs can actually fall short. Um, so basically at every step of the process, I mean, it's like there are potential leaks in that pipeline between taking people, get, you know, get, building up their skills and putting them into jobs. But there often isn't enough funding really to do all of those pieces. Um, and so because when you think about it, I mean, it's like, you know, people, if you take somebody, I mean, it's like who's dropped out of, uh, out of the education system. I mean, it's like they're basically going from a system that invests $19,000 a person, you know, a head per year on them to a system that, that sometimes invests less than $1,000 a person. You know, so I mean, it's like that's an enormous transition there. And the, if, if they're lucky, they'll have programs that can invest several thousand dollars on them if they're in a privately found, uh, funded program. But at the scale that we need, I mean, is it given the huge needs in New York City, we just don't have enough public funding that's dedicated to the programs that really, really work. And we're not looking at how what we're doing is actually working. So at every level, I mean, it's like there are, there are shortcomings, really. So, so I guess there's some programs we know that are working? <laughs> yes, we do. Um, so uh, for instance, I mean, to, to give an example from the, uh, the panel that we held last week on, uh, or actually the week before, I guess, on um, scaling up programs that work, we had Perscalas as uh, one of the, the people, I mean, one of the, we had the head of Perscalas as one of our panelists. And this is a program, of course, that's been evaluated that you know it there's it, that it's been shown to work yet they and they have been able to expand in new york city to a certain extent but a lot of their expansion has actually been national and that's because a program like theirs they have not been able to find always i mean it's like the public funding to allow them to serve more people in new york so luckily for them 
because they're working in the tech space and there's a lot of you know, money in the tech space and because they're training people for, you know, directly for companies that are based in New York, uh, those companies have been able to support uh, their work with, with private funds again. But again, the problem is that that expansion didn't happen through public funds. It didn't, you know, through taxpayer dollars, it happened through private work. And so Barb Chang actually was talking about something extremely important here, about the, the importance of foundational skills. So, you know, getting to uh, uh, Councilman Menchaca's point about what are the jobs for the future and how can we prepare for them and how do we deal with, it, with automation. It's almost impossible to find out to say there's going to be 600 jobs that are growing in this field that is not going to be automated in 20 years. It's almost impossible to be able to say that. But what you can do proactively right now is say we know that what people need to succeed in the future are these 21st century skills, you know, critical thinking, team building, et cetera, et cetera. Often those are called soft skills, but I mean, it's, there's, nothing, there's nothing soft about them. They're really 21st century skills, the skills of the future. And that kind of programming doesn't plug directly into a particular company. So there are very few private companies that are going to say, hey, I'll fund this kind of work. So this is where the public sector really needs to those come Those are in. really supportive skills on top of whatever the, the exactly. training. Exactly. And that's where the public well. sector needs to come and that, in. And that, yeah. that obviously is something that is, is not, may or may not be added into the course, whether or not a person can get to a location and, and operate independently and be able to train because they lack other skills or have other uh, life situations. Right. I'm sorry, Councilman. Do you no, thank you. Come? I just wanted to interject briefly. Um, the consortium actually trains sit workers citywide. We like to say that there is no wrong door. You have a constituent that might live in your district but work in Helen Rosenthal's district, and we make sure that we have brick and mortar services available to that worker no matter where they live or work. I'm sorry. Um, we have citywide services, um, your soft skills, your workforce training available to workers citywide. Um, also to your earlier point, council member, I wanted to interject that we also do, um, the consortium is very data driven and we have a, a wealth of data, not only on the recipients of the programs, of course it's self-identifying, so it is, it is limited in that uh, respect, but we also do retention up to a year after the person is placed in a program. So uh, in addition to the career counseling, we really track them where they go after they leave us. And I think that we're unique in that respect. I just wanted to point out to, to, to your question, Council Member Perkins, about uh, what works, what doesn't. One of the big problems uh, we've encountered at the Central Labor Council in our work on large building retrofits, which if we can complete it, will create thousands and thousands of jobs every year on union pathways if we insert uh, labor standards into the subsidies of those. But uh, one of the things we found was that if you look at the federal level where most of the workforce development dollars are coming from, and the administration alluded to this, the problem is it's so disjointed that nobody actually knows where the money goes or what it goes to, it would seem. There's a really great report that when um, Bill Thompson was comptroller, he did on this. He did two reports on this actually, and um, I can find out the names and get them to your office of the reports, but he goes into just how difficult it is to actually figure out where the money is. So the city ends up being unable to touch a vast majority of it, which is tied up in some in strings, and so the money doesn't actually get to where it needs to go, which is why we end up relying on these public-private partnerships to fill skill gaps, and I think also sometimes, and, and granted I'm speaking as the, the labor guy, so this is sort of my role, but sometimes I think when we're talking about workforce development, we get tied up in the skill gap discussion, that everything can be solved by filling a skill gap with another certification or another class. So today it might be in vogue to tell everyone to go and learn to code, and last week it might have been vogue to in vogue to tell everyone to go out and learn how to be a pharmacist. But the reality is at the end of the day, if we can use government in a smart way and the leveraging of our dollars in a smart way on capital funding to create long term workforce development programs, like with large building mandatory retrofits, uh, you, could, you could start to game out and plan a generation's worth of work and work in concert with the unions, with the training funds, et cetera, to create many, many positions, many, many apprenticeships, and provide local hire opportunities. How long is long term? I'm sorry? You mentioned long term work 
workforce development? Sure. I mean, well, if we're if we're thinking about to the point about the jobs that haven't been created yet, we should be thinking 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I use our example of large building mandatory retrofits as a great example because think about it. The government has the ability to mandate something. Through that mandate, there will be workforce opportunities generated. You know that there is some amount of quantity that will have to meet that mandate. And so you can start to actually game out and figure out how many people in each a decade afterwards it will take and that's only one example you could you could look at all sorts of projects but fundamentally my point is the government has the ability the city has the ability using their dollars and investment to create jobs and if if it's done in a way where you're thinking holistically about long-run opportunities there are more long-run investments in creating ca career pathways through a, say a union apprenticeship than there is in the short-term gain of a low-wage job that isn't going to generate much revenue. It's very true that we got all the jobs back we lost in the recession. The question is, what's the wage differential of pre and post, and what were those jobs created in? Mostly low wage, low skill jobs, and that's the problem. I mean, to support what he just said, I mean, um, and also to, to get to your point about how, lo how, how long term is long term. Well, our public education system is long term. Universities are in it for, you know, for the long term as well. But when it comes to human capital development, when it comes to workforce development programs, we don't know how long it's going to last. I mean, we were just talking about a program that might just end at, end at the end of this year. Imagine if our public education systems and if our universities might just cut out after your junior year. We don't really have a system, a human capital development system for people that don't go to four years of college. And that's the central problem that we're really talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. And, I, and I, you know what I would just say, too, in, in listening to that, I think by not having that, we kind of lend ourselves to those predatory folks that come in and exploit the industry. And in, in the time when the economy is really bad, every commercial is a training school or something that's going to give you the skill to earn big dollars and, and folks go out. And then ultimately, they're not even providing the skill level that allow you to walk into those jobs or even the next level of training. So it's certainly something that, that it's always about enforcement, that we create opportunities for a target audience. But if you don't have enforcement and we're not understanding and preparing that target audience, then it kind of goes by the wayside. So data is important, and what all you do is important as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and we've been joined by Council Member Eric Aldrich. The Brooklyn Chamber and uh, Opportunity for a Better Tomorrow, Evelyn Ortiz, Albert, and Nelson Gonzalez. Did you get a chance to introduce yourselves? <laughs> By all means. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, um, committee, Councilmember Perkins. I'm Varun Sanyal, Vice President of Economic Development at the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, here delivering testimony on behalf of our President and CEO, Andrew Hohn. And joining me here is my colleague, Athena Hernandez, who's the Director of our Workforce Development Program, Good Help. Job creation and workforce development is a key priority for the Brooklyn Chamber because an effective workforce is vital to meeting the needs 
of a robust economic development occurring in Brooklyn. In the Brooklyn Chamber's 2016 state member issue survey, 52% of participants indicated that they plan to hire one to five new employees. However, many firms said that finding and hiring qualified workers was a challenge. We believe that one way to reduce the occurrence of short-term placements is to increase the focus to employer-led workforce development. While job placement satisfies recruitment goals, gaps will appear in the system if individuals are not comprehensively supported by evaluating their current skills, inquiring about their desired field of work, and mapping out a tangible pathway to a sustainable career through training and skill development. Judging from the placements that we facilitate in sectors such as hospitality, accommodations, food services, construction, and manufacturing, these sectors largely lack accessibility to training and entry-level careers, especially for those that come from economically disadvantaged populations. Apprenticeship and training opportunities that create pipelines into these sectors would particularly benefit individuals who do not have a post-secondary education and provides prospects for financial security. We recommend several enhancements to the current city system of workforce development, focused on empowering employees to be the centerpiece of the network. One, increase accessibility and funding for on-the-job training and customized training programs, along with a focus on streamlining the process for accessing the funding available through these programs. Creation of satellite workforce offices, as opposed to one primary center, that may not be accessible for residents living in neighborhoods across the borough and city. Enhanced funding for training vouchers for Workforce One participants to seek employer-mandated certificate and training programs that may otherwise not be available through the centers. New York and Brooklyn continues to lead in private sector job creation, and it is critical that a workforce program is as innovative and adaptable as the innovation economy of the borough. On behalf of the members of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, thank you for the opportunity to testify. And we look forward to working with you and your colleagues to strengthen workforce development across our city. Good morning. My name is Evelyn Ortiz, and I am the Chief External Affairs Officer at Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow. Thank you, um, fellow members of the council. I'm pleased here to be here today to provide testimony regarding the city's Career Pathways Program. And is it on? Can you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Sorry. Okay. So founded in 1983, OBT is currently one of New York City's largest provider of workforce development and educational services for opportunity youth ages 17 to 24 and adults who are disconnected from education and or employment. OBT serves over 4,000 youth and adults annually across six sites in Brooklyn and Queens within the neighborhoods of Sunset Park, Bushwick, Bedford-Stuyvesant, and Jamaica, Queens. OBT's programming is based on a model that combines the most comprehensive academic and vocational support needed to move individuals to self-sufficiency. First, we want to thank the city for the recognition that a pathways approach means that workforce training is not necessarily linear, nor one size fits all. Community-based organizations like OBT have an opportunity to better support program participants with a more holistic group of services that have multiple entry and exit points, offering ongoing educational and career advancement opportunities at every step of their career, and critical interventions such as child care assistance, housing referrals, food stamps, and other benefits. The Career Pathways model aspires to create this multiple entry, multiple exit approach that not only aligns with our mission as an organization, but reflects the reality of what our communities need to fully participate in the economy, in the economy of the city. While the Career Pathways model aims to create a more differentiated system, at OBT we continue to experience several factors that put pressure on the system and require both additional resources and an increased coordination of services. For instance, we've noticed that there's an increased need for basic skills support. Over the past five years, OBT has seen some important shifts in who our high school equivalency program is serving. For our most recent cohort in fiscal year 17, in literacy, 51% of youth participants are at a ninth grade level or below, with 20% at a seventh grade level or below. In numeracy, 63% are at a seventh grade level or below, 37% are at a fifth grade level and below. 
Students are taking longer to pass the task compared to the GD. At OBT, we have seen that the amount of time that it takes someone to prepare for the task exam increased from five months to a full year. While we collaborate with the New York City Department of Education's District 79 Pathways to Graduation Program, we've had to make our own investments in strengthening basic skills preparation for those individuals with the lowest levels of readiness. The increased amount of time towards completion requires additional resources and creates a significant hurdle in the job placement timeline. There's an increase increase in barriers faced by youth and adults. While OBT has always served youth with significant barriers to employment, we have seen increases in the number and level of need. Barriers include court-involved youth, young parents needing child care, youth in transitioning that are transitioning out of foster care, youth living with unstable housing conditions or are homeless, food insecurity, lack of access to transportation, and an increased number of applicants with an IEP. The most recent data shows approximately 40% of young people at both OBT's out-of-school youth programs in Bushwick and in Sunset Park have received IEP services in the past. Now, OBT's successful bridge programs, as we look at our most effective initiatives targeting youth with significant barriers to employment, requiring strategic city funding bridge programs, we have found that individualized services create high-impact support. So some of these programs include the Young Adult Literacy Program. These are all DYCD-funded programs, and what we're encouraging you is to continue to make investments in such bridge programs, such as the Young Adult Literacy Program. We have a young adult here today who will testify on behalf of that program and its success. 72% of participants were able to make a reading or math gain, of which 30% were placed above a ninth grade um, literacy level and were placed then in OBT's full high school equivalency program, the Young Adult Internship Program Plus, which is a program that focuses on foster care youth um, or who are transitioning out of foster care, and then the P3 Initiative, uh, which is a federally funded program, um, which is uh, alongside with, the, uh, with DYCD. Um, the initiative aims to assist young parents with securing child care and facilitate parenting workshops. Um, it increases the timeline for those young adults because it's taking them longer to actually obtain their high school equivalency due to child care challenges. And then college persistence. We've under, we understand that young adults who are aiming to go to college need more supportive services, specifically once they enroll in college. Um, so we provide them services while on site, while they're in school. And we've noticed that 68% of our our alumni who enrolled in college in fiscal year 16 successfully completed their first um, year within a two-year or four-year institution. Um, we have various programs that address both youth and adult needs. Um, we spoke about it, it was spoken about earlier in terms of the adults, specifically those who are in need of adult literacy services. We want to make sure that you understand that there's a need for, um, for more investment within the adult literacy programming, um, specifically contextualized learning. We want to make sure that adults have access to the employment opportunities that are available within their communities and that they're being skilled up for those opportunities. Um, Council Member Menchaca specifically specifically stated that Sunset Park is one of those communities that is rapidly, you know, it has incredible um, access to, to different types of manufacturing jobs and so forth. We want to make sure that we can upskill our um, residents for those um, opportunities. So overall, what we're trying to um, show and say is that there needs to be more resources that are implemented within programs that already have, um, that have demonstrated success. You know, these are city-funded programs, and we understand that, you know, we heard SBS state that you know they, there's a seven there, there was already a seven million dollar investment in bridge programming we encourage that there's more investment that is made uh, within the next year you know there by 2020 that they can spend down the 60 million dollars that, that they committed to spend down um, and that you know if, if you are encouraging collaborations and partnerships, that there's an investment that is made and not that the nonprofit or like the community-based organizations are required to make their own individual investments and require are, or are required to obtain their own private funding in order to make this happen. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nelson Gonzalez. Uh, I am the director of Adult Employment Programs for Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow. And I'm here representing my participants. Uh, I would like to share a story of an adult participant that limited by challenges affecting many New York City residents, but yet still seeking sustainable employment in order to achieve economic mobility. Let's call her Ms. W.B. She is a single mother of three who has to juggle her time between securing her children's health, nutrition, and shelter needs, 
while having to make sure she prepares herself for her future and that of her children. While searching for certifications that would support her career goals, she walked into OBT's Bushwick Workforce Resource Center to earn a chance at acquiring certifications as a Microsoft Office Specialist and through the National Retail Federation in Customer Service Skills through our Adult Employment Program for SNAP recipients this past uh, summer. Like her, there are many that without funding for bridge employment programs which create pathways into careers, would find it hard to access such trainings due to their financial limitations, lack of education, and employment experience. These programs provide intensive job readiness, case management services, one-on-one -on -one support from job developers that understand employer needs, and provide access to job opportunities that are not readily accessible. We need to continue to evolve to fit the needs of our communities as change is undeniable. Through the implementation of the Career Pathways initiatives to move away from mass recruitment and hiring towards one focused on education and job training, providing families with sustaining wages, we're stepping in the right direction. While we keep in mind individuals like Ms. WB, we cannot forget the, to engage the local and small business sector of our communities. According to our own New York City Department of Small Business Services, 81% of businesses in New York City and 84% of those in Brooklyn and Queens are small businesses. So these owners of the services, uh, they wear many hats, including that of recruiters, and it is hard for understaffed companies due to financial restrictions to meet their re own recruitment needs as they remain underserved by most workforce programs. We must strengthen industry par partnerships with employers to meet their staffing demands, keep fostering local business growth, and provide individuals like Ms. WB with access to local employment opportunities. It is with much delight that I would inform you that Ms. WB contacted us last week to thank us of our services and support that she received while in the program. The approach of teaching soft skills as part of the certifications program combined with the one-on-one -on -one meetings opened her eyes to the potential she did not realize she had. After completing the training, she applied for a team member position with a local nonprofit. Not only was she hired, but she was hired as a team leader, providing her with a better wage and opportunity. Please continue to invest in bridge employment programs which help provide high impact support services and industry recognition credentials for the most underserved populations seeking investment in order to sustain themselves and their families. And on their behalf, I thank you. Hello? All right. Um, yeah, the light's on. Hello? Okay, good. Um, I'm currently a uh, participant um, from OB. Uh, my name is Albert Johnson. Um, I, I'm a part, I'm currently, I was a participant in um, the Young Adult Literacy Program, for, and um, that was formerly. Um, but good morning, everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Albert Johnson. I was born and raised in a Hispanic family in Staten Island, and for the past 12 years, I have been living in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I am filled, to, I'm filled with joy to share with you that as of last week, I've passed the SAS exam. I am overwhelmed knowing that in a few weeks I will receive my high school equivalency diploma. Thanks. It may not seem like much to some people, but it means a life's dream. Exactly. All made possible with the tremendous help I received through the Young Adult Literacy Program and the Out of School Youth Program at Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow. I am here today to tell, talk to you about the importance of edu education and bridge programs like the Young Adult Literacy Program that are available for youth who are between the ages of 16 and 24 like me seeking to succeed in college or at work, but need extra support. I joined OBT in 2016 after dropping out of high school during my sophomore year when I was only 16 years old. I dropped out not by choice, but life happens. One day while waiting for the bus to go to school, a car hit me and left me without the ability to walk. You can only imagine the excruciating physical pain and emotional struggles I was going through. With all that, I still attended my regular high school, walking with crutches. 
And when this became too much, I've transitioned to homeschooling up until one day this alternative was no, no, no longer available. I could no longer go to school and felt like I was lost. I fell into depression for a, few, for a few years. All I did was sleep, wake up, watch TV, and research about my condition. I couldn't believe I was out of school for s- seven years and that, was, and that I was 23 years old. I was at a point in my life where I didn't have many expectations. One day, a friend of mine, Hector Gonzalez, talked to me about opportunities for the better tomorrow and how they helped him get his GED. Hector suggested I give it a try, and so I did. OBT welcomed me, and it was a breath of fresh air to be there. After taking the reading and writing math assessment, I was placed in the Youth Adult Literacy Program at the Bushwick location. It is a bridge program that would help bring my readiness, my reading and math scores up so that I could successfully transition into OBT's out of school youth program, where I would get my task, obtain job readiness skills, and obtain assistance in enrolling in college or finding employment. At OBT, I felt a true sense of belonging in the, com- in the community that cared about me and that cared about all the participants. It was hard work since I had not been in school for a while. I had to readjust my sk- sleeping schedule and had to cut off on watching cartoons or whatever so I could get to classes on time. Um, while I was in the program, I had 100% attendance, except when my wheelchair broke down. All my teachers, counselors, and staff in OBT helped me with my confidence, self-esteem, and motivation. They, they ensured I completed my homework and I, that I participated in all activities. Um, at OBT, I learned academics, financial literacy, how to build my resume, and interview properly. I learned how to present myself to others and to network with professionals. They taught me how to dress professionally and, re- and receive clothing when needed from their Opportunity Boutique. I also explored career, college options, also career and college options. For all those great things, I want to thank OBT. Um, As from someone that came from the um, Young Adult Literacy Program, I I do encourage that you would continue to invest in programs such as this, such, because coming from me and taking quite a while to get, to, to transition from the Young Adult Literacy Program to the out of school youth program and then you know recently graduated so i do um i do encourage you as to encourage um to um to be to encourage people like me to become motivated to um to continue um you know with furthering my education and career goals so on and so forth thank you very much mr chair Thank you. So um, I guess we, we, we've heard from uh, uh, organization that, that, that was able to articulate the work that they're doing in the communities throughout the city, particularly I know of in, in, in Brooklyn and Queens. And for, for full disclosure, I've had young folks uh, from this organization that have interned in my office and, and done extremely well. And uh, we look forward to continuing to uh, be able to be supportive. And I think that we've been able to answer some of the questions about what is actually happening, what those demographics and and individuals who are being served look like, um, what communities they're coming from. And that is really important for us to grow and get better. And I appreciate that, the work that that, that we're doing together. So um, thank you. I'll call the next panel. Final panel, Jesse Lehman, Eric Antical, Ariel Savern, Ariel, and Kerry Fallibar. Thank you. 
Gracias. We'll get started. And I have a uh, testimony from Mr. Lehman in my hand, as sure. well as. I'd be happy to lead off. Yep. All right. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman Miller and uh, Council Member Perkins, as well as to all the other council members uh, and council staff who helped uh, make today's hearing possible. Uh, I know I won't have time to read through all of my testimony, and so I'll just go over some of the key points and some of the recommendations that we have. Uh, my name is Jesse Lehman. I'm the Director of Policy at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. The coalition is the umbrella organization that represents 180 organizations in New York City that provide some sort of workforce development services, uh, including some of the folks you've heard from before, such as Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, who are just sitting here. Uh, also, the Consortium for Worker Education, run through the Central Labor Council as a member, uh, and some of the folks that I'm joined with here at the table are members of the coalition. Uh, and you know, we want to present some some broad uh, sentiments around career pathways and the path forward. Um, I think the first thing to understand is that the community of workforce development providers is strongly behind the vision of career pathways. We believe that the report that put it, was put out three years ago is the right way forward. And we're glad to hear uh, representatives from the administration, from SBS and from the Office of Workforce Development talking about that vision still being central to this administration's plans in the future. Uh, however, it has been three years now since that report was published and embraced by the administration. And there have been, unfortunately, sort of minimal and halting progress on some of the key recommendations within the Career Pathways report, as yourselves and some of the other council members that were here before pointed out in your questions to them. Uh, and so the real focus of our testimony today is on those areas where there has not been enough progress and where we think there needs to be a real urgency of action in the next year to get on track to meeting some of the goals of the Career Pathways plan. Uh, and so our recommendation number one, uh, and this touches on a topic that Chairman Miller, you brought up, the administration must get on track to meeting the budgetary benchmark of $60 million in funding for bridge programming by 2020. Uh, it is understandable that they would want to start out by piloting programs and by testing programs that work. But there are already many privately funded and independently operated bridge programs out there that are working well but not at a sufficient scale. There are the publicly supported bridge programs that have been mentioned, uh, and I think um, uh, Ms. Mallon mentioned a few really good examples, uh, the LaGuardia Community College Bridge to Health Program for uh, bilingual home health aides. These are all great programs. There are great models out there. They need to be scaled up, and scale comes from funding. The fact that we are three years in and we're talking about six and a half million dollars, uh, or seven and a half, is not nearly enough. That is recommendation number one. And number two, uh, and Christian Gonzalez from the Center for an Urban Future touched on some of this as well, uh, is that the industry partnerships, particularly the new ones that have been launched, simply don't have enough to show for them for their work so far, and there needs to be an urgency to getting those really operating and actually training people. Uh, and I can talk about some of the numbers in, in a minute if we come back later uh, from some of the testimony before that were concerning to us and that we'd like to see uh, expanded in the future. And just briefly, my final recommendation uh, that I will note is that with regard to SBS and the Workforce One system, um, we need to know who SBS is serving now in order to know who isn't being served. Uh, Jackie Mallon talked about 25,000 people placed in jobs and just 4,000 people sent to training through the Workforce One system last year. Uh, I, the real concern for members of our coalition is that the people who need the most services, whether they're English language learners, people with court involvement, uh, people who have had long periods of unemployment and don't have marketable skills, they aren't getting the services they need, they need through Workforce One. There is a piece of legislation introduced by Councilman uh, Matthew Eugene recently, intro 1736, which would require SBS to report on the key demographic data of who is going through the Workforce One system. 
that would be an important first step to understanding where we need to go from here. Uh, I'd be happy to answer more questions and to provide some more numbers, but I want to create the opportunity for my colleagues to testify as well. Hello. So my name is Annie Garniva. I'm actually the Director of um, Communications and Member Services also at the New York City Employment Training Coalition, and I'll be submitting testimony on behalf of Eric Antical from one of our member organizations, Non-Traditional Employment for Women. You do not have his paper. He left and did not give it to me, so that's why I'm submitting it orally, um, and we'll be passing that testimony on to you after the fact. Um, so through, uh, as you all might know, Non-Traditional Employment for Women is a highly successful pre-apprenticeship program that specifically focuses on um, helping women enter the construction trades which have predominantly been white and male um, uh, throughout history. And they have significantly moved the needle. I think the number is up to approximately 10% of women from prior to the program starting about a decade ago. It was about 3%. Um, so that is a highly successful model that um, answers the questions that we try as a coalition to focus on that Jesse just alluded to, which is not just job development, but job development for whom and how. Uh, we represent about 800,000 collectively and, um, job seekers that are predominantly low income and minority who are significantly stuck in a cycle of poverty due to the fact that a lot of these investments that we make are not geared towards their specific needs. So um, new is an example of a program that tackles those needs and that we think should be in programs like this should be invested in. Um, New wanted to emphasize three different points through their testimony that um, this committee should look into. One is the need for more pre-apprenticeship programs that specifically focus on um, the wraparound services, so things like that were previously alluded to by OBT, so, th so things like um, social outcomes, um, literacy requirements, basic math. Uh, those are currently not taken into account, and so people that start off that do not have those fundamental skills find themselves consistently shut out of programs like NEW and other programs that we represent like Perscolis. So that kind of requirement would be served better served by what you've heard over and over again are investments in bridge programming that help people um, learn the basic math and literacy skills and oftentimes are wrapped around by languages um, in order to then be able to access the highly successful construction programs that exist, or tech programs. STEM is a sexy, um, ha is having a really sexy moment. However, the 800,000 people that we represent will never be able to enter those jobs without a multi-year uh, support. This will take, if they were underserved by the public school system, they'll continue to be underserved by the workforce development system unless we actually t tackle those fund fundamental skills problems. Um, and third of all is the social service, the wraparound services problem, which was previously alluded to by OBT, which is requirements like follow up once they enter a job, learning how to deal with um, cultural differences within an, a job where currently the culture is unlike the people that are entering the system, um, learning how to uh, ask for an increase in pay. Those are all currently not part of the system and people that have not learned how to deal with those kinds of problems won't learn them on their own. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Arielle Savransky and I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation of New York. Um, on behalf of UJA, our network of nonprofit partners and those we serve, thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony on New York City's career pathways and workforce development systems. I want to start by thanking the council and the administration for your commitment to investing in adult literacy programs, which we view as an integral component of an effective workforce development system. We would also like to thank the administration for the recent investment in a workforce development program serving Haredi Jews throughout the city. However, New York still has a long way to go towards achieving the goals laid out in the Career Pathways Blueprint, and we would offer the following recommendations, some of which echo what my colleagues here have discussed already. First, we urge the Council and the Administration to use the Career Pathways Blueprint as a guide to create a stronger workforce. Fiscal year 2018 marks the third year of a five-year plan to transform the city's workforce development system. The goals of this transformation are to expand access to career track jobs in fast-growing industry sectors, 
improve job quality, and foster a more cohesive workforce. If substantial new city resources are not made available, many low-income and unemployed New Yorkers will be left out of the growing economy. We also urge an increased investment in bridge programs for low-skilled job seekers and middle-skilled job training. Bridge programs are essential in helping New Yorkers with gaps in their skills, education, or credentials get the training they need to either find a quality job or enroll in a more advanced course of study. The blueprint, as my colleagues have discussed, calls for an investment of $16 million annually by FY 2020. The budget for FY 18 included only $6.4 million in funding for these programs. Our agencies work with many immigrant families and communities, providing services to put these individuals on a career trajectory and setting them up to be able to support themselves and their families, who will not have access to these services should funding not be increased. Lastly, we urge the Council and the Administration to work together to restore and baseline $12 million for adult literacy programs and work to develop a task force on adult literacy. As a member of the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy, thousands of students will lose their classes without the restoration of this funding. Furthermore, single-year funding makes it difficult to operate programs, retain talented teachers, and threatens to interrupt student gain. It also does not allow DYCD to update reimbursement rates and program design. Additionally, we urge the Council to work with the administration to launch an adult literacy task force to examine the city's adult literacy system and make recommendations to improve coordination, referral, and outcomes. We look forward to working with the City Council and the Administration to create an effective workforce development system that has the capacity to serve the individuals who need these services. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Hi, good afternoon and thank you. I'm Carrie Fallhaber and I currently serve as the Vice President for Partnership and Community Engagement at Jobs First NYC. Uh, for 10 years, Jobs First has been working with local communities across the five boroughs, developing and supporting collaborative and innovative strategies to find effective solutions to support out-of-school, out-of-work young adults in New York City. We welcome the opportunity to provide high-level feedback on the progress of the Career Pathways strategy and look forward to working with each of you to ensure that every young adult can access the economy and reach their full potential. My testimony today will focus on two critical areas. First is how the Career Pathways framework, and by extension the City of New York, does not adequately address the specific needs of the out-of-school, out-of-work young adult population in New York City. And second, to echo my colleagues here, um, the City's slow approach to funding and scaling effective bridge programs. Over the past five years, New York City has seen a notable decrease in the number and share of young people ages 18 through 24 who are out of school and out of work, from 22% in 2010 to 17% in 2015. However, the barriers faced by the remaining 136,483 young adults aged 18 to 24 increases the challenges to serving them. Recent research by Jobs First, which will be published in the coming weeks, has also surfaced a new set of structural challenges that New York City's out-of-school, out-of-work population is faced with. Among them include how most job growth over the last five years has been in part-time work, as full-time jobs have decreased. And even with a tighter labor market and increased demands for labor, wages for young people have decreased. Additionally, despite higher high school graduation rates and increasing college enrollment rates, a growing number of young people are leaving college without credentials to enter the labor market, with many falling into low-wage work or becoming part of the out-of-school, out-of-work population. Despite these new structural challenges, as well as some persistent barriers for out-of-school, out-of-work young adults to participate in the economic life of New York City, the city has not adequately responded with its own strategy. In fact, much of the youth workforce development discourse has been focused on programs that mostly serve in-school youth, for example, the Summer Youth Employment Program. We recommend New York City create a comprehensive strategy that addresses the specific needs of out-of-school, out-of-work young adults. 
We are encouraged by the creation of the New York City Disconnected Youth Task Force and will look to this initiative as a vehicle to developing, executing, and watchdogging a citywide strategy to fully address the specific needs of New York City's out-of-school, out-of-work young adults, similar to the one the City of Los Angeles has implemented. The Los Angeles Performance Partnership Pilot is a leading effort of the City of Los Angeles, the County of Los Angeles, Los Angeles Unified School District, Los Angeles Community College District, local Cal State Universities, Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, Los Angeles Housing Service Agency, and over 50 public, philanthropic, and community-based organizations to improve the service delivery system for the disconnected young adult population and connect them to the economy. This in initiative, outlined in Los Angeles Performance Partnership Pilot, 2017 to 2020 strategic plan is an unprecedented effort in Los Angeles and across the country to coordinate and integrate the delivery of education, workforce, and social serv services to disconnected youth. I won't review the core functions. They're in the testimony there. What? Please wrap it up. Okay, sure. Um, I'm going to jump to the concern about the bridge programming. We recommend that the city invest $20 million to fund and scale bridge programs in the next budget year and the remaining $33.6 million the year after, which would bring annual funding to $60 million by 2020, as the city committed to in the Career Pathways Plan. Um, there's examples there of working bridge programs in two partnerships that Jobs First NYC has worked with. One is TechBridge, uh, an initiative of Perscolis and the Door. And as others here have noted, Perscolis has outcomes to back their, their programming. And this is a bridge program that has upskilled young people that were unable to enter Perscolis's training without the bridge program. And another example is a partnership with Comprehensive Development Inc., the career, CDI Career Academy, in partnership with BMCC, a I'm, bridge I'm program. I'm sorry. So, so um, your clients come from where? My, well, Jobs First is a nonprofit intermediary, and we work with in, yeah. direct service providers all across New York City. So, so, so this is a, a collaboration of workforce providers that you're speaking specifically about? Yes. Um, jobs you're talking about one or two programs out of how many? These are just examples. Jobs First launched an initiative in 2012 called the Young Adult Sectoral Employment Project, and through that project, these are two of the programs, two of ten. How many are in, 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 enrolled in the program? How many are enrolled in Perscolis' training? No, in, 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 the, in the initiative that was just launched in 2012. Um, how, how well, many? the Jobs First initiative has to date served over 1,600 young adults and placed more than 50% of them in employment and over 700 of them have received industry-recognized credentials. And how many vendors are involved? Um, there's a, 11 collaboratives. Each of those collaboratives has at least three nonprofit partners in them, so over 33. Okay. Do you find that... that that it is difficult to work with uh, that many different groups, or is it, obviously that's your goal to, to bring people together and kind of be able to facilitate this, but is, is it something, because we've been kind of grappling with this all morning on, on what we thought was the best method to provide these services and mm -hmm. whether or not, and, and uh, we all agree that um, we agree with the importance of, and, and the mission of workforce development. We just don't know if it's doing what we set out to do and how do we capture that, how do we ensure that through data and transparency. Um, but I love to hear these stories, these success stories, um, but we want to be able to go somewhere and be able to pull them down so that when young folks come into my office and they come to visit Councilmember Perkins that we can guide them in a certain direction and that we can put our stamp behind these organizations and the training and uh, the skills that they're gonna be able to provide for these young folks. Often not very easy to do, right? And, and so um, 
I, I think that's really uh, a part of what the hearing is. I mean, the mm -hmm. city wants to talk about what they're doing, but we are we are service providers, just as you are on that end. That is exclusive of what we do. We serve uh, the communities that that we. In fact, we serve the city as elected here, and we want to make sure that we have products out there um, that meet the needs of of our constituency. And, and that's what we're trying to really drill down on today. Is, is it happening? Are we doing what we set out to do three years ago? How far are we out in that plan? And we rely on the experts to tell us that it is working, that it isn't working, that we are lacking resources, that we need to reorg the resources or whatever is going on. And so that's kind of what we're trying to get to. And uh, while we have all the experts in the room yeah. today. Thank you. Sure. And, I mean, Carrie, to pick up on that and to sort of answer uh, the councilman's question, um, I mean, I think that the short answer is that, yes, there are programs out there that really are working. Uh, the, the trouble is that they're not big enough scale because of a lack of public funding mm -hmm. and that there is not a smooth enough connection between the public workforce system, such as the Workforce Ones, uh, and the industry partnerships that were recently launched and these many community-based organizations that are running these effective but relatively small-scale programs across the mm -hmm. city. Uh, and Carrie referred to a couple of these bridge programs, and I think the thing to just to note, for example, about the Tech Bridge partnership between Perscolis and The Door is that that is funded with phil philanthropic dollars, not city dollars. And so people are getting onto a career path towards a really good uh, career in technology, people that oftentimes did not finish high school. Um, are going through this bridge programming and then through Perscolis' programming. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that if the city stepped in and scaled up bridge programs like that, we could get more people those sorts of opportunities. Um, the other example, just I wanted to, to call out something that uh, First Deputy Commissioner Jackie Mallon talked about as an example here where the public system is not working as well as it needs to with the existing independent operators. Um, she talked about the launch of the training program for line cooks, uh, if you recall. Uh, it's called Stage NYC. Uh, it's run through the, the new industry partnership for food service. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a small scale program that just launched and she didn't actually provide any numbers on whether any people have graduated and gotten placed yet. But we know that just within the Employment and Training Coalition, we have providers such as Project Renewal and the Doe Fund that are providing culinary training already for people that have experienced homelessness. We have providers like the Osborne Association that has a culinary program for people that are formerly incarcerated. Um, we have uh, uh, Seedco that provides culinary training for people that are unemployed, and FedCap that provides culinary training for people that are on public assistance. And all of those culinary training programs are larger than the new Stodge program that the City of New York just launched. Why isn't the City of New York working with those providers and funding those providers to scale up and train more people from these high needs communities to get good jobs as opposed to trying to reinvent the wheel and create a new entity. Um, those are the sorts of disconnects that, that we find troubling that we think really uh, could be resolved through better oversight, better management, more empowerment of the Office of Workforce Development, uh, and things of that nature. Yeah, and, and I'll add, um, I think all of us in this room know that Partnerships are difficult and partnerships are costly. The capacity to maintain them and ensure that there's a framework in place that will uphold a partnership that has been developed. All of the work that I've mentioned and, and the work that Jesse has mentioned is these pathways are done in partnership. No one organization can get somebody from, uh, speaking of young adults, from a place of being out of school and out of work into a credentialed programming. There's partners along the way, just as the door partnered with Prescolis, each leveraging their own expertise. And the, the funding, the, the level of funding that they're receiving from private funders just, you're right, can only train so many people. And it, the, the capacity to scale up the, the, would require support from the city funding. Okay, again, I want to thank everyone for coming out. This information and your input is vital to uh, 
the workforce development of our city, and we want to make sure that that, that we also have the, the hearing is about checks and balances here, that, that we are working and we are achieving what we set out to achieve. I'd like to, to thank everyone for coming out. I especially like to thank uh, Council Member Perkins uh, for uh, uh, your due diligence. I know this has been a long day and for sitting in, we had a hearing going on right across the hall as well. We've been joined by a, a, a number of members and, and the staff, I want to thank them so much. It has not been easy coordinating these joint hearings as well. Councilor, thank you uh, uh, for the work that you've done and Matt as well and to my staff, Brandon uh, and Joe as well. So. Um, Yes, and Corey, and account, we've been joined by Council Member Corey Johnson as well. And so I did hear again from Council Member Cornegie. He sends his apologies, and uh, he uh, is in the midst of a family emergency, and we keep him in prayer. So with that, I call this uh, hearing. It's now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.